Ano mai hari mai, um, ki te mihi nui. Uh, welcome to uh, the Environment Canterbury and the resumption of our hearings process that we concluded uh, last week, had two sessions last week and we've got three this week. Um, Mr Hill, is that you there? You're not MS Teams again. Oh, we were expecting you to zoom on us. No, that's fine. That's, 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 that's fine. It's good. It's good that I recognised you because we would have been waiting all day otherwise. So before I get started, uh, my name is Peter Scott. I'm Deputy Chairman of ECAN. Uh, we have Chair Huey, who's overall in charge of this process, sitting over here to my left. Uh, and and I'd ask that before we start, if we could do a karakia to start today's proceedings, uh, Councillor Pulley. あ、たちみたいパリカワマハヌイキテポイポウテラキホイハキピバイカホワタフリマティホクデテアウコテペノタキイワイタヘアティヘイバリオラ。パチミトタヒミキナトカハロワアホマオカホマワロワキアマトイ
to accommodate. It doesn't actually do very much except frustrate the situation. And actually, if you look around New Zealand, not just here, if you look around New Zealand, there's a lot of it. And the water situation here is an example of it. You've got you, CCC, and the mayoral forum, and the result is the worst possible outcome for the ratepayers. A dosed supply, which we're going to have to pay for, while you supervise or oversee a foreign company exporting pure water for nothing. That has to be the worst outcome. Um, there is no reference in the plan that I read of any attempt to reform or adapt defective mandates, which is where all the problems, a lot of the problems lie, and you have defective mandates. But I would have thought given the turmoil in central government and the, the coming, the forthcoming repeal of the ECA of, of, um, of the Resource Management Act, you would be really laser targeting all your efforts to getting your mandates sorted out. Because at the moment you're migrating across other people's patches. I'll give you an example, forest and bird, fish and game, dock, and now you. Which one wants to know about the stoat on the riverbank? I mean, surely we don't need four. What are you doing? Three of them must go. Uh, there's no suitable offering um, on, on the reform. Um, I see you have a lot of visionary plans, but they're not mandatory. They're not necessary. Um, and I think one thing I really want to do is to concentrate on flood control. You've said that certain essential works may not be undertaken unless you get your increase in full. Let's see what you've done here. What you've said is that certain works have not been done. If there is a flood in the same way as there was in New South Wales just recently, the insurers will get claims. As they did with the Port Hills fires, they'll look for a culpable body. In your documentation, you say you have not done essential flood work. They will sue you because you will lose. You really will. And they'll sue you for everything that it's cost them because you're culpable. They may not get it all, but you don't have any money. So where will you go? you go back to the ratepayer. The worst of all possible worlds. What you've done, if you think about this, think about this through, is that you have just written off the value in every Cantabrian's insurance policy so far as flood control, flood insurance is, is concerned. It's really that serious. Now, I can't see how you can break this circle You've said it, and you're waiting for a flood. I mean, you may not get a flood, of course. But it does show that you're not thinking things through. You've been cavalier and casual in this, and this is seriously dangerous for every Cantabrian. The only way I can see this being resolved safely for a Cantabrian is that ECAN gets disestablished. Lots of people will be disestablished in the coming months, coming years. And I think for the next election, there will have to be a great deal of thinning down of government because it is going to be accused of profligacy. Mr. Schumann, can I make a point of order? Um, my order, point of order is this, that this seems to be just a criticism of ECAN rather than... Can we just leave the point of order until the end? Mr. Hill has got a submission. He's got a time to give us a submission. Mr. Hill, carry on. I'm more than... Sorry, Mr. Hill, could you push a button again? Sorry, so, okay. Um, my, my submission on your, I, I've more or less finished. I don't want to sort of spend time going over things that I went at some length to, to bring to your attention before. It is, I think, that your, your plan is ill-founded, ill-starred, not justified. You are running all sorts of risks that you shouldn't be running and you don't appreciate what they are. Now, if I've probably run out my, my time by now, and I don't think I really want to repeat things, so I'm, I'll hand back to the chair. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Mr. Hill. Uh, questions from around the table, please. Councillor Farn. Thank you for your submission. Um, look, noting all your very extensive comments about, you know, I think your ideal would be that we would be disestablished as an organisation. Um, until that time, when we look at our own business as part of this long term plan, could I interpret um, your submission as being reducing what you call the tissue governance within our own work? So things like reducing silos, reducing any duplication, that kind of thing. Could I could I constructively interpret it in that way? Or are you yeah, any thoughts on that? And and push your button, please. No, you're absolutely correct. I don't actually wish, wish anybody that out. What well, this is game of musical chairs. I don't say that ECAN is going to fail. Somebody will, because you know you, when you look at the thing of the the stoats on the riverbank. I mean, three people need to be out of that business. The taxpayer can't afford it. So if you can get your mandates right, which is absolutely critical, if you can say to the government, we have a defective mandate on water. We want power over charging, dos you know, dosing supply because we have got to pay for, if you talk about water in broadest terms, the outfall quality is not up to it. The input quality is not up to it in a large number of places in our area. We have flood control to deal with and we have people taking water for nothing. And we have the Christchurch residents being asked to pay for it. We want to put all this together in one pot. Give us a proper mandate. And, you know, you need to be into central government saying, give me a mandate that nobody else has. I don't want a mandate. I don't want to be creeping across the dock. What, why are you doing that? Because it just exposes you. It's Doc's job to deal with or whatever it is. There's a lot you don't want to get involved in. In my view, there's a lot you don't want to get involved in. You want to be focused on what you do best. Um, I honestly look at a lot of what you have here and it's aspirational, inspirational, if you go for that sort of thing. And bluntly, I don't. I don't think yesterday was a desirable time. I really don't. Um, yesteryear cannot be re recreated, nor should it be. There are five million Kiwis between you and yesteryear, and they want houses, places to work, and so forth, and that has to be done. But... Thank you for your submission. Um, just a question on your comments regarding um, public transport and buses. Um, you said that we prefer to do nothing than to do something. What would you like to see us to do in that space? Not sure I want to drop down that hole. Thanks very much. <laughs> um, I um, did talk to Stephen Simon Lowndes some time ago on this very subject, and I, I said the Plenty of opportunities you've got, and of course, since then we've had COVID, which, but that is just a disguise. If you had a bad input, COVID will not change it. When COVID is gone, the bad input will still be there. I think you've not. You can try anything rather than do nothing. I mean, what you've got is a situation that hasn't worked in the past, is not working now, and looking at your budget won't work in the future. You're showing numbers that show costs doubling and revenue stalling. If this is true of whatever it is that you're doing in Timaru, I don't know. It has cost money, it will cost money. You did look at trains and said, no, no, too difficult. No, actually, it wasn't too difficult. That was handed to you on a plate. You could have done that. It may not have been successful, but it's worth a try. You've got to try. You've got to find a solution. It's your job. You're going to take the mandate. You've got to find the solution. You can't sit on your hands and say, this is what it is. I'm wasting taxpayers' money. I'm wasting ratepayers' money. And I, you know, that's not tolerable. It really isn't. Thank you. Any further questions around the table? No, thank you, Mr. Hill. And I did do say I did enjoy reading your submission. You put a lot of thought into that. And there's a and there's and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of me that agrees with some of the stuff you're saying. But thank you for coming in and doing this. Thank you. Uh, just before uh, Mr. Gould is next, uh, and he's got uh, Sustainable Action Group uh, for the Environment, um, and he's also got a personal submission. So just before we do that, can I just remind questioners, uh, questioners, councillors, that there are no points of order. 
uh, when we're in the submissions process. The submissions process is for the submitters. Uh, and we are here to hear the good, the bad and the ugly in terms of our performance across the year and the next 10 years. So if we could just seek clar questions of clarification once the speakers have their turn to speak. Yes, Ms. Uh, Mr. Chairman, are you really saying that the st our usual standing orders don't apply? I am. That's what I'm saying. This is a submission process rather than a, a, um, a, a formal council meeting, a formal uh, council process. Yes, Mr. Mr. Gould, and I understand. So you have ten minutes on each of these, uh, John. But if they merge, then that's fine. If you just make the distinction when they do. Yeah, you right hands. Your right hand, Ben. Yeah. Um, first of all, um, thank you very much for the opportunity um, to submit this morning, um, and thank you to the staff at ECAM for all the hard work they put into the long-term plan. Um, I am going to sort of merge my two submissions um, and I'll explain where there's some points of difference. Um, I'm involved with a group at Lincoln University called the Sustainable Action Group for the Environment. We're very much focused on trying to increase sustainability at Lincoln on the campus for the Lincoln community. And so we've been lobbying for things like trying to get the, the coal boiler uh, shut down. And, and it was a small victory when the vice chancellor announced that would be shut in 2023. One of the challenges we are currently working on is the fact that there are 1,300 free car parks there. We think it's one of the only tertiary institutions in New Zealand still offering free parking. And that, of course, encourages a lot of people. Um, but so in terms of my submission this morning, those points relating to transport, and I'm involved with the, um, this we call SAGE, Sustainable Action Group for the Environment. I'm involved with their transport subcommittee. So it's in that capacity that I'm um, presenting on behalf of SAGE, and we have had input from the whole group. Um, and my personal views on transport and those of SAGE um, correspond. But I'm also going to make a few comments on other aspects of the plan. And those I have you know, not necessarily received the mandate of the wider SAGE. So those are personal comments. So if, if, if I just make that clarification. Overall, I believe that you've got the priorities and the sort of issues for the long term plan um, correct. There aren't whole areas or categories that I would like to add. But if, as the plan states, our vision and purpose, i.e., ECAN's vision and purpose, is taking action together to shape a thriving and resilient Canterbury now and for future generations, then this plan seems likely to fall well short of realising this vision. While the right issues have been prioritised in the plan, it seems to focus on addressing the symptoms of the current environmental crisis. And in order to be truly a truly transformative plan, it needs to start addressing the underlying causes. And my submission is focused very much on environmental sustainability. Now, obviously, I cannot expect a small regional council in New Zealand to address the fundamental issues, fundamentally transforming the growth-based, profit-driven, exploitative, linear economy where we take, make and throw away things. And I accept that that's completely beyond the scope of the plan. Nevertheless, it, in my view, only by taking urgent steps, both glo globally, locally and individually, to move towards a truly circular economy modelled on nature, which has sustained life on Earth for almost four billion years, reusing and recycling everything 
will we build a genuinely sustainable future? So that's the kind of intro, but what can we actually do about it here and now living in the current reality? Well, among the actions which could start moving the long-term plan in the right direction would include, in my view, funding major campaigns in public education and awareness raising to alert the population of Canterbury of the consequences of not changing our current lifestyles and business as usual approach urgently. And I have just one question here, if I may ask, has the um, has ECAN uh, signed up to or stated a, a climate and ecological emergency as the government of New Zealand and city council have? Well, in that case, you know, what I'm saying, I think, has particular relevance. It's essential that people start to reduce their carbon footprints. And we can do this by incentivizing carpooling because people are going to drive anyway. But if you have two people in a car, you halve your carbon footprint. If you have four people in a car, it's only a quarter. We need to encourage incentivize active transport, walking, cycling, scootering. My colleague Catherine will say more about that. And we need to promote public transport. So why do I put a slide up saying this is one of our biggest polluters? Because it is. Why? Because buses running empty are far more damaging to the environment, produce far more emissions than a car with one person in. Now, I know living in Canterbury is a rare sight to see a full bus, but I'd just like to pass this picture of a bus full of people around to remind people that it is possible. Uh, that's the number 28 bus at uh, 7.45 in the morning. Uh, and in my view, it's madness. We're already subsidizing the buses to a, a, a huge extent. Let's start filling them with people. I will come back to transport again and say more about the specific solutions. But I just want to, first of all, say a few comments on other aspects of the plan, get those out of the way, and then I'm going to focus on transport. In terms of water, it's my view, and these are personal submissions that we, we need much stronger regulation, monitoring and enforcement, especially of nitrate pollution. It's a no brainer. And why are we exporting billions of litres of pristine Canterbury water to China in plastic bottles for peanuts? When we know the sustainability implications, it's just a madness sending water all over the world and especially in plastic bottles. I'm sure I don't need to say any more on that. In terms of biodiversity, why are we continuing to destroy the biodiversity when we know we're in an ecological crisis, replacing it with monocultural agriculture for profit? In terms of climate change, we just need to educate ourselves. It's taken me 40 years to reach the point that I realized just what, what an existential crisis we are facing. I studied climate, climatology at university 40 years ago. I know a little bit about it, and I've just been increasingly more concerned year on year. And we need to promote public transport, promote restoration of, of uh, native um, bush, um, so we start not only reducing the amount of greenhouse gas emissions going out, but start sucking them back in, restoring the soil, sequestering carbon wherever we can, whether it's through wetlands, um, regenerating forests. I'm more in, in favour of regeneration of native bush than going out and planting trees. Do that as well, but regenerate where you can. So let me come back to transport. And this is where the my views and those of of SAGE do agree, although it's not we don't disagree on other matters. I have also been submitting to Christchurch City Council on, on their climate change strategy that incidentally has a cyclist with a child on the back on the front cover, which shows where their thinking lies. 
they have identified transport as the main source of greenhouse gases in Christchurch. And I should add that my submission is focused mainly on Christchurch and the satellite towns and not further afield in Canterbury, especially in relation to transport. So if we want to reduce emissions, transport is a very good place to start. And there's lots of opportunities. We've got a great bus network. We've got a great new central bus exchange. It works really well. The problem is that it's, it's completely underutilized. The buses are running empty and they are part of the problem. If we can fill them, they'll be part of the solution. If we can get more electric buses involved, they'll be part of the solution. I know the cycleway is city council business, but we're all living in this area. We've got a great you know, cycleway network developing and more and more people are using it. And I think e-bikes are a really transformative thing in that sphere. Um, Catherine and I are both enthusiastic e-bike users. Um, the last time I spoke on transport, I had a new e-bike and people were impressed that I'd come in from St. Martin's in 11 minutes. Um, I have now clocked up 12,000 kilometers in the last couple of years on that e-bike uh, commuting out to Lincoln. It's a joy. It's a win, 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 win. Saves my pocket, saves the environment, good for my health and good for my soul. Road network. We've got a great road network, but half the time it's congested when people want to use it because there's one person in every car. Carpool. And this is where public education and campaigning promotion can be part of um, ECAN's contribution. And what about those underutilized rail lines? And I won't say much about urban planning, but you know, a compact city and build, avoiding building satellite settlements miles from the center are not uh, environmentally sustainable. So what are the solutions? Well, I've hinted at those already. Catherine will talk more about active transport. That's her area of specialization. So I'll leave that to her. Obviously, we want to develop the light rail for commuting since we've built these satellite settlements out at Rolleston and there's so much development going on Lincoln now as, as well. How do we encourage carpooling? Well, again, partly public education, but in Auckland, they have the T2 and T3 lanes. Now, this is probably outside the jurisdiction of ECAN, but you can lobby to the New Zealand Transport Authority um, and, and, and central government to try to get even just during rush hours. If it's required that if you use a certain lane, there are two or three people in each car that will start to normalize carpooling and people will save money and they'll get to know each other. But my main focus and the main point, and I, I'm, I'm sort of getting towards the end now, reinstate the electric bus around the CBD, investigate the possibility of park and ride, but for goodness sake, get people on the empty buses. It drives me mad at night when I see buses going past with nobody, one person, two people until late in the evening. It's great to have the service, but let's start by helping the people who need those services most, the people with least money who haven't got three cars parked at home, the community card holders. Let's make the buses free for them. The pensioners, they, some of them are stinking rich and they get a pension and they're working. But because they're over 65, they can go free on the buses from nine to three and they use it. And that's excellent. But what about the young people? If we want to get people commuting out to Lincoln, then make it free for the under 25s. I mean, you could make it free for everybody, but at least reduce the price. Make it two dollars a ride for everybody. Everybody else. Sorry. Um, I'm, I'm almost there. The bell's gone. Um, set targets, you know, next year, this is what we're going to increase and just get people on those buses, please. Um, thank you very much. I'll take questions now. Thank you. And thank you for your passion on that, John. It's a big subject. Council Farmer. Yeah, thank you so much for both of these submissions, John, um, and conveying the sense of urgency that you feel around these issues. Um, I really wanted to just hone in on your, well, what I interpreted as your main thrust around public education 
it probably didn't come through in our long-term plan, but what last annual plan we approved a climate change public awareness campaign, which is about to launch next month. In line with that, would you, is your um, encouragement in that space about continuing that public education, um, putting more resourcing into it, thinking bigger, or the fact that it's there, are you happy with that? And then we should divert resources to other areas that you've mentioned and push your button because I've stolen it. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for that question. I think public education individually, locally, nationally, globally is at the heart of this because if the public is really behind, there will be more and more demands to do things. We, we're seeing the, the young people already demanding the mayor to you know, stop the Taris Airport and so forth because they have learned about climate change and, and they can see the future. You know, I accept the budgets are limited and so forth. And I think that the public education needs to be much more solutions, solutions focused than problem focused, because otherwise we're just all going to end up as, um, you know, bitter and twisted as me, um, feeling that the future is hopeless. But I mean, when I see those young people and that action, then I do get some sense of optimism. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Councillor Clearwater. Thank you for your submission, John, um, and your passion. John, I just wanted to ask you, you've made a couple of references to um, all different bus routes, one being the bus, restoring the bus service in the CBD. And I think you, you also referred to in your notes to um, the Hall's Wall to Lincoln. So I just wondered if you might, is one of the, is, are you really asking ECAN to consider looking at um, additional route, additional bus routes, as well as upgrading the service? Um, I guess my feeling is that if we can get people on the buses, then there will be demand for more routes anyway. If the students at Lincoln, you know, can go out, get the bus free, then, you know, and we, we're already encouraging them to carpool. If we can start charging them for parking out there, there's a big incentive for them to start using the bus and to demand for more routes. I take the bus from St. Martin's to Lincoln, it's an hour and a half. So that's on the wet days when I can't cycle, or, but I can cycle to the hospital, leave the bike there and get the 80 straight away. That saves me half an hour. Um, you know, there are ways and means. With, if, if I didn't have osteoarthritis and, and a, a, a bionic knee, um, I would be on an ordinary bike and I could put that on the bus. So I think all that helps. And if there is a way of being able to take more than two buses on the, on, on the you know, uh, bikes on the bus, I think that would also help. But uh, I can appreciate the technical issues with that. OK, John, I think we've just about done time with you, but thank you for your submissions and uh, combining them the way you did. Uh, so thank you, and I'll call Catherine to the table. Catherine. Yes, your button, Catherine, is there. Tana Kato Katoa. Hello, I'm Catherine Elliott. Um, I'm an exercise and active transportation researcher out at Lincoln University. And um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. So just going through uh, my submission, I'm also on the transport subcommittee and I was on the pub public transport advisory group here with ECAN um, and advising on some of the student and staff needs for transportation out to Lincoln Uni, as many people live in the city. Um, so um, just going through my submission briefly, and then I'll get into some of the solutions to, or some solutions that I see for some of the issues that John raised. Um, I think one of the biggest, one of the significant challenges and opportunities is really changing the mindset of the people. When I first came here um, almost six years ago, I asked the students, why don't you use the bus? And they said, oh, that's a loser cruiser. You've heard it all before. And I just thought, Actually, I've been on the bus. I came here with a folding bike 
and I brought the bike on the bus. So I took the bus to work from Riccarton. I specifically looked for an apartment so that I could get, you know, the bus from the city to Lincoln. So it was on, the, <laughs> I was limited to the 80 line, which was fine. I found a spot, took my bike and it was great. And I was like, I don't understand why they think it's a loser cruiser. They're actually pretty comfortable and modern. And I didn't understand it because I lived, I'm from the US, but I lived in Switzerland. So I'm really used to um, multimodal transportation, buck, bike, bike and bus and tram and train. Um, it's part of normal everyday life. So when I came here, I was pretty shocked that people were so against it. And then I um, went to a walking cycling conference and that's when I really learned, I saw the guest speaker, they said, people are not in love with cars. And I think that's what we don't understand. We're not in love with cars. We're in love with mobility and freedom. And whatever mode gives them that is what is gonna win. So whenever you do something here at ECAN, if you can think about, before you tick the box to make it policy, does that give them the freedom? So right now, car is king because we've developed motorways, we've put millions into motorways, um, we've given them enough bloody free parking. Now things are starting to change and you're starting to see it. And now we have e-bikes, people are having other modes. They're starting to do the math, but it's still not there. The tipping point's not there because we haven't charge the heck out of the cars like we could. In Switzerland, I asked my friend, why don't you just buy a car? He's like, actually, cars are unaffordable here. Even on a Swiss income, cars are unaffordable. So we haven't done that. And that's part of the reason the buses are empty. Cars are too cheap here. My friend just left back to France paying triple for a car, the same size that she had here, same little little thing. It was like 5,000 euros. Here, she got it for 2,000. <laughs> so. It's a real shocker how cheap cars are, and that is a real problem. So if you, um, I'm gonna hand out the research uh, John and I and some others have done. If you can just take one for every other person, I've only printed 10. So those are the results of the survey we've done in Lincoln, over 300 students, over 100 staff, I believe the numbers are at the top. The main point of that, um, probably on the back pages is looking at um, the main thing, the barriers, the benefits. People are time poor. We all know that everyone in this room, we're all time poor and we don't want to pay. And so those are your costs. So we, when you can start to look at how a person determines their mode, you know, you can sit in the transport planners, just use their models. You know, at the end of the day, the models go so far, but there's still human behavior. And if we can start to make these alternative modes sexy, you know, the iPhone, they put their, their phone up there. There's no other advertising. They don't tell you how many gigabytes, any of that. It's the sex appeal, okay? They just show you the phone, that's it. And that's where I think we need to work to get that message across. So how do you do that? You need to work with events. And it doesn't have to be about sustainability. Green is not, well, it's starting to become sexy, but it's not exactly the sexiest sell. So we can't say come by bus because it's sustainable. We need to make it the obvious choice. Come by bus so you can drink. <laughs> okay, that speaks to university students and it's pathetic, but that's the truth. So come by bus so you don't have to drive back. You can all drink. You don't need a DV. There, there's other things, not actually quite a few students are not drinking, so I shouldn't really pitch that completely. But um, but come by, come by bus because you can have fun on the way there and not be stressed out and not have traffic and all these other things. Bus priority lanes, yes, <laughs> combined with combined with um, with bikes or bike bus lanes and make them really, you should give tickets to the bloody motorist. The bus, I see it all the time, I'm on my bike. The bus driver has a signal on to enter back into the lane from picking up and dropping off some people and the car is just, no one's stopping and giving the bus priority. We need to start ticketing motorists who are not, you know, the signal is there. They should really be given the priority because hopefully, you know, in time, if we can make some of these changes, there'll be 30, 40, 50 people on the bus. 
So, um, you know, there should be should be a campaign like, thank the buses, thank the bikers. They're one less car. In the bus's case, 20 less cars. So where is the mindset? Instead of saying, take the bus, we could, we could really promote all of these other things around it. It doesn't have to be a message of sustainability. It's, it's a message of, oh, come to, you know, if we're having partner, it was one of the things that said partner with um, city council with their events team so that every time there's an event, these are the buses you take. It's an extra three bucks on the cost of a ticket, you know, working collaboratively, three bucks on the cost of a ticket. And now you don't have to worry about parking and you don't have to walk there. It goes right up to the front. Same with biking. Whereas every time I run an event, I put the bus, how to get bus access, how to get, um, what kind of bike parking is there? Because at the end of the day, a lot of policies, not just that you can, but city council are made for, you're going to be shocked here, 30 year old white males, middle class to upper class. A lot of the policies are made for those people. The people who aren't in this room that aren't represented, low SES, um, Thank you. Um, and and people who don't have a voice. So that's why part of why I'm here today. I came on the public transport advisory group uh, four years ago, and I said public transportation or mobility and transportation is a right, not a privilege. And guess what? They increased the prices of the fares and they've decreased the services. They've cut a few lines out. So what are you telling people? You're saying only the rich can afford buses. And guess what? The rich already have nice cars. So you missed your market there. So we need to lower the prices. I've got a few here. So although um, the, the bus is the biggest polluter when it's empty, when it's full and hopefully electric, that's where we're going, um, it's actually one of the biggest solutions. So you're sitting on the biggest problem, and if you do it right, you've got the biggest solution. This is Axel, um, Axel's research, 2019. He said, what are the perceptions of public transport? You see the big ones there. Slow, infrequent, expensive, and unreliable. So we need to prioritize them. They should be king on the road. The buses are actually seen, should be seen as the savior. What do people hope for public transport? Same. Um, pretty much the opposite, frequent, reliable, and free. So why not pilot a free trial? And I think that's in the plan. Um, this is just some data. Look at the humps, the increases in patronage. One of those had to do with the bus exchange. Do another bus exchange. I know they're talking about getting rid of it. I think that's ridiculous. It's the nicest, um, uh, the one in Richardson. Anyway, that's, I think that's a great hub. And I think it's, we need more of them and we need multimodal. So it shouldn't just be about bus. It, it, everyone in here has different ways of getting around. We have different needs, even from day to day. So how can we link some of those hubs? And you can see some of the lines. Okay, um, just some research on basically how do we get the money? Because that's all, that's what you care about at the end of the day. And we need, uh, Sarah Templeton said about 100, 20 per annum per household in rates. It's not sexy, but it's a solution. And with that, we can all have free buses. Now, if you don't want to do free, second option for you, um, I'm going to pass this around. This is the real kick home thing in 21 minutes. Um, average, this is from our survey, average person at Lincoln takes some 21 minutes to get there. So that's a competition. And guess what? On this on this sheet, there's white bubbles. This is if you start at Lincoln in 21 minutes, public transport, aka the bus, gets you to those spots. So with the exception of the people living in Ralston and Prebleton, they cannot get to work and back or school and back. And the cost, um, please consider extending the um, student pricing, the child pricing to 18 to 25 year olds, please do that. If you don't want to give it free, then it's only 15 bucks a week, which will cover the cost in their petrol for that same distance versus right now, the student has to pay two zones, which is ridiculous, even when they live in Prebleton. And that costs them if they come every day, or sorry, Monday through Friday, that's 38.50 a week. 
So if we can get it down to 15 and Lincoln makes a commitment to charge for parking, which is what we need to do. We've been begging, but our senior management does not want to make that mandatory, but we're working on it. Um, That's you, Catherine. That's you. And again, thank you very much for that. Some great information there. We've got one question. Uh, well, let's let's do that. If we've got questions, let's email Catherine. So thank you, Catherine. We're just getting a bit behind. Sorry, uh, Alice. Yeah, well, Alice Shanks. Alice. Thank you for allowing us to talk to our submission and apologies from our colleague down in South Canterbury, Rob Smith. So the relationship ECAN has with the QE2 National Trust is through the 2008 uh, Biodiversity Strategy for the Canterbury Region, a document that has been um, looked at and it still stands firm. So. The first goal and that is protect and maintain the health of all its significant habitats and ecosystems. So I noticed that you want to stop any decline in our environment and you want to partner. QE2 is an example of the power of partnerships. Here we have covenants in Canterbury. They are obscured. Those are those um, pink dots. And you can see that we've got 14,000 hectares of private land that landowners have set aside for conservation. The QE2 Trust has been going since 1975. It works under an Act of Parliament. And at the moment, we've got unprecedented demand. The key to the Trust's work is fences. Fences grow trees. For conservation, we build fences to keep stock out. Uh, we build fences that we in, to last 50 to 100 years, like some of the many old total fences that we replace. Uh, the middle top picture is um, a fenced covenant full of gorse, which has now been registered with the ETS. After 30 years, it is a burgeoning forest underneath that gorse. So not only are we protecting biodiversity? We are adding carbon to the world. Um, so how do we work together? Well, first of all, we have great relationships with the ECAM biodiversity officers, uh, some that we count as friends. Uh, we, the landowners come to QE2 uh, and they, they are motivated around conservation and they're looking for permanent legal protection that will last beyond their tenure on the land. Uh, they also commit to fence maintenance and weed and pest. The ECAN um, Intermediate Steps funding through the Zone Committees and the Canterbury Biodiversity Strategy Fund uh, enables us to QE2 to apply for grants on behalf of the landowner. Yes, we take that administrative burden off them um, to um, usually split fences, about 50% ECAN can and the rest between the landowner and QE2. And QE2 in return maintains an ongoing relationship with those landowners, future landowners, the land monitors effectiveness and sometimes, well, very rarely can legally enforce their covenants. And you'll be pleased to know that the first example of this was in North Canterbury and was successful. So in the last five years, ECAN has contributed $977,687 towards uh, the partnership with QE2 and the landowners. That might sound like a lot of money, but that actually only worked out at $417 per hectare for permanent conservation land that you do not need to own and you do not need to manage. What we're finding now is that 
landowners are getting quite ambitious when they are, are talking about setting aside land for conservation. In the old days, it was a small patch of bush or wetland out the back of the farm. Uh, Miles here, my colleague, um, he just did a 200 hectare covenant in North Canterbury, which needed six kilometres of deer fencing. That was a $205,000 in fencing. Um, if we had not been able to bring in that extra funding from ECAN, it would have been a small 10 hectare covenant. So what we're what we're wanting, it, what we need at the moment is that people are queuing for covenants. We're constrained by the cost of fencing and the availability of grants. So I'll leave that challenge with you. Uh, this is a typical, this is why we love fencing. This is a um, typical response of removal of stock from um, uh, some Tanuka uh, covenant on Banks Peninsula. Um, it's just, it's like a miracle. You take the stock out, the trees grow. And for this couple, they ended up with some seedling kikatea arriving naturally in their covenant. It was a exciting day for them. I'm going to pass over to Miles. I know when I started the job, one of the first uh, 20 odd years ago, one of the first covenanters I visited said, I hope you like killing things. And I wonder what he meant. And he said, conservation is involved involves to a large degree killing things that's pests and weeds and it's including livestock getting rid of that herbivory taking away the constraints to natural regeneration of forest in the moment we have that is still a major thing with a lot of the covenants landowners retain the ownership and the management responsibility for covenants and pest and weed control is a really big thing and that's ongoing and it's not as if New Canterbury has reached any sort of equilibrium we've got emerging weeds things are changing things are getting worse and we are needing to put more and more effort into that uh, some of the examples there, Chilean myrtle top left, it's a South American plant that's getting quite invasive, has the potential to be a real problem. May 10 seed down on the bottom left hand side, that's another thing that's really taken off lately. Sycamores on the upper right there, that's a real problem, especially in moist areas like South Canterbury, Hunters Hills and Polypodium, the fern, um, an exotic fern down bottom right there. The um, pictures in the middle showed the spread of Polypodium over the last uh, 30 odd years, 30 to 40 years, how a few years a few decades ago, it was just a few little patches on the Port Hills. Now it's all over Banks Peninsula and unfortunately it's also all through North Canterbury. And it's going to be a real pest and a biodiversity pest in the next next few decades. And there's a lot of plants around that at the moment we don't think terribly much about. But they are there, they are as sleepers and quite often there's a, there's a lag phase and then they take off. And consequently, that's one of the big things with QE2 covenants is not only getting the covenant legally registered the legal protection onto it but being able to make sure that landowners are in a position to be able to look after the covenants thereafter so um typical uh, most of the covenants in north canterbury typically about 90 odd percent of the funding goes towards fencing that's a little sample i did a analysis of a while ago about 90 percent of the funding goes towards fencing about nine percent towards pest and weed control up front with the with the um, onus on the landowner thereafter to be able to look, out, look after things and probably only about 1% on revegetation planting. So we're looking after what's already there. Um, timeliness of weed control is very important and proactive um, input's important and we are certainly concerned about emerging weeds and uh, the regional pest management plan um, making sure that emerging weeds that are going to become problematic are identified in time and the things that are done in a timely fashion before they actually, before the horse bolts, as it were. Moving on. Um, fencing of covenants is hugely important, but um, that'll usually keep livestock out. Good quality fences will keep livestock out, but of course, a lot of pests will not respect fences. They can get, deer can jump over conventional fences, possums and rabbits, things like that can move uh, through fences. So one of the big issues is uh, the emergence of deer again. Uh, about two or three decades ago, deer numbers were really low because of the recovery of animals for a number of purposes. Um, they have absolutely shot through the roof, especially in the last 10 years. It's a major problem with a lot of covenants in North Canterbury, coastal North Canterbury at the moment, the very high deer numbers. So we've got a cohort of, like it's a five finger in the left-hand photo that are absolutely getting hammered at the moment, especially ring barking of them, and that's killing them. Uh, we've got the same issue we're down in South Canterbury with wallabies as well. They have exactly the same sort of impact. Um, if we go back again, Alice, sorry. 
Um, on the right-hand picture there, that's matai trunks. These trees are 10, 20, 30 years old, and stags are rubbing and taking the bark off those. They're very preferred. They love rubbing their atmos on podocarps. And there's a real risk that we're not going to get that podocarp recovery, the original dominance of a lot of those forests, because of the burgeoning numbers of deer. So one of the things we're doing at QV2 at the moment is putting much more funding and emphasis on trying to get deer fences rather than conventional fences. Costs about $10 a metre more, but much better results. Moving on. Uh, this is down to South Canterbury Wallabies. They are an absolute menace uh, down there. You'll see that this absolute skin, there's no understory, there is no ground cover, and there is very little recruitment of the key canopy species. And we're on sh on a trajectory to nowhere if we can't get those wallabies under control. That's a, that's a really serious problem for biodiversity down there. Uh, restoration, one of the answers, a lot of people think planting is the answer, but planting is very expensive. Q2 covenants typically cost about $650 a hectare. That's a figure I figured out for North Canterbury, about $650 a hectare. A commercial rate for restoration would be about $65,000, which is a one to 100 difference. So we emphasize, we really emphasize that sticking to the aim of the biodiversity strategy that is protecting what is already there is the most important thing we can do. Planting is necessary in the likes of the Canterbury Plains where there's basically not very little left to protect. But a lot of places you're going to get far better bangs for bucks by protecting what is already there rather than planting. So planting we regard as a last resort, not a first resort. Um, so in summary, I would say that Q2 has a very productive relationship with Canterbury at the moment. Um, it's really good outcomes on the land and we would just like to make sure that you're, you're aware of how productive how it is at the moment, how much it's valued and we really do want to continue with that relationship. You're looking at a few different tweaks and things with the long term plan here. We want to make sure that we don't throw out what we already have at the moment. Thank you. Look, thank you for coming in and giving us your time this morning and talking to us about QE2. It's something that we all um, all support, I guess, but it's uh, it's interesting to see your photos and the devastation that's caused after you're trying to protect something. So we've got time for maybe one or two questions. Mr Chairman, can I just um, uh, express a conflict of interest? I'm a subscribing member to QE2. Yeah, thank you. I'm sure if I have a conflict of interest, uh, I'm aspiring to uh, have a covenant on that place, but that's, uh, we're, we're not there yet. But the uh, I guess my question, Miles and Alice, is uh, we have biosecurity advisory groups. You're not directly involved with those, or are you involved with some of those? And, yeah. and, and I can't help but think that your advice you've given us today in your submission might be really useful advice for those uh, bad groups. Thank you. Um, the minutes are not available on the ECAM website. I have no idea what's been going on in those meetings for a year, but I'd really like to know because I'm very interested in weeds. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Barnes, your last question. Yeah, thanks so much for your submission and particularly highlighting the numbers of Environment Canterbury's contribution because often it's hard for us to visibly see what's going on there, but that was really clear. My question was around the unprecedented demand in QE2's operations, and I'm just wanting to know if we were to, for example, take you up on that challenge of further investment in QE2 and our contributions, would that go directly towards the work on the ground? I mean, I know the number of, it's Rob, Miles and Alice, you're the workers, um, you know, is there need to, would there be need to scale up in terms of peak boots on the ground, so to speak, or, or do you feel like you could deal with the unprecedented d demand between yourselves, but you just need more resources. I'm just interested in that. Sorry, in your button. Thanks, Miles. The funding from ECAN certainly goes to the projects on the ground. So Alison, my, myself and head office, etc. we are funded through central government and we are always cap in hand to central government. But uh, yeah. Okay. So so you mean the capacity is there within your own staff? It's, it's really the resourcing that you need? QE2 will need to up its capacity. I started as the sole representative for Canterbury 20 years ago. There are now three of us, and I'm still too busy. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for coming in again, and uh, we will consider what you have told us in our deliberations, so thank you. Yeah, can I just do a bit of housekeeping here in terms of uh, we're due to break at 10.15, but I'm going to push us to 10.30. We've got four submissions uh, to hear 
um, if we get that far. Is Garth, Garth Wilson is next? Is Garth here? Garth Wilson is next then. Uh, what's that? And he was very early. Was very early John McKim, uh, then Federated Farmers, and then Peter Richardson. So we'll just see how we get on. Don't want to push everyone for time because you need to take your time. <coughs> we might just not have to have uh, a cup of tea, people. Uh, good morning. I'm representing the Central Record and Residence Association. It, uh, there's about 4,000 people that live in our area. It's the most densely populated part of Christchurch. Um, we don't detect any antipathy towards ECAN at all. Uh, people in our area say that staff answer their questions directly and civilly. So, but our people have a real concern about the way ECAN spends its budget. Um, yeah. So, we're asking for a thorough, a thorough review before any spending takes place so that the spending is done responsibly and efficiently before you decide on any increase in rates. You've heard a lot this morning earlier on about aspiration. Our community's really concerned about taxation. If I could show you a slide on the Rickerton Ward, we're part of the Rickerton Ward. Now, the deprivation index shows that we have the worst deprivation in all of Christchurch. And yet some of the Rickerton Ward includes houses north of Rickerton Road that are million dollar properties, quite a few of them. But in the rest of Rickerton, things are not so easy. 77% of our, uh, our area in central Rickerton have an annual income of under 50,000. And only 6% of our people that live in central Rickerton have an annual income over 70,000. And these are what our, these are the issues our community faced. And it has got worse since COVID. Those figures were 2018 from the census. Things have not been easy. Uh, many people have either lost jobs or found that full-time work has become part-time work. And we're really concerned about any rate increase at all. So we're asking ECAN to be very judicious in its spending. And we think that some money has been wasted. Um, for example, the recent Metro bus rebranding. We didn't think that the design rebranding was necessary or the repainting. We didn't think the so-called cultural advice on the color design was necessary. And we're concerned there was no public consultation whatsoever before ECAN went ahead with this rebranding. Our community aren't against buses, as you will see, but we want the money spent to be spent more wisely than on superficial things such as rebranding. In fact, people complain that it's very hard to see the buses along Rickerton Road because they merge with other vehicles, trucks, uh, and with, with shops. And particularly frustrating is the fact that you cannot clearly see the number of the bus or actually the name of the destination. It's really difficult when you're looking into the sun and at nights. And a simple solution would be to have the numbers of the bus in a bright yellow cover on a jet 
black, black background. And the same with the name of the destination, because it's too white and too light. And it's really, really hard to see, especially when, as along Rickerton Road, four buses can be coming one after the other. Now, the next issue we have is with the, all these large buses. This has been mentioned before this morning, with hardly any passengers between 9.30 and 2.45. And that includes the orbiter route, which only a few years ago was vastly popular. And so we're asking the question, why have large buses, especially empty ones, chewing up the roads, chewing up fuel and causing unnecessary gridlock for other vehicles when, when smaller, more nimble buses would cause less wear and tear on the roads, result in greater savings in fuel and result in fewer clogged roads, especially Rickerton Road. Now, Smaller, more nimble buses work very well in Europe. These aren't buses like the shuttle bus from the airport. They're buses with an aisle right down the middle of the bus and two people sitting on each side of the aisle. And they work extremely well. And this would save the wear and tear on the bigger buses that could be reserved for the peak hours. It seems strange to have these big buses with only one, two, three or four people in them. And that is a frequent occurrence between 9.30 and, you know, 2.45 when secondary schools uh, students get, get out. So we're asking for a better use of the money on transport. Now, we're hoping that Environment Canterbury is going to make a submission to the Christchurch City Council about the bizarre proposal to shut the bus lounges. We find it extraordinary, after all the work that ECAN and Dame Margaret Baisley did some years ago to get these bus lounges up and running, as it were. OK, there are 800 movements of buses along Rickerton Road, and ECAN has already signalled that there will be more buses going down. You're going to increase the frequency. And what concerns us is that the Christchurch City Council closeout report on Rickerton Road that was delivered at the beginning of December last year said as well as linking people to Rickerton as a destination, the bus lounges on Rickerton Road are a key connecting hub on ECAN's network, linking passengers to other services, enabling them to get to work, home, or other areas around the city. Yet a matter of just a few weeks later, out comes a consultation document that recommends the closing of the bus lounges. And our members are almost universally opposed. Only one of our members voted to close the bus lounges. And when I asked him why, he said, oh, well, there was trouble, social trouble outside the lounge. So we're hoping that you people will speak out in, to keep these bus lounges open. No, you're done, you're done, Garth. Are you are you at the end, Garth? Have you have you finished, Garth? Yes, I have. Thank, thank <laughs> you, thank you. Look, um, <clears throat> the matters that you bring to us from the Res Residents Association are central to some of the decisions we have to make. So thank you for that information. Uh, that leaves us a bit more informed. Now we've got a question from Councillor Sunkel, and we'll take one more after that. Thank you for that. And the matters you've raised, we're, we're well aware of. Just confirmation for you as a, as a tight community, the bus service for the people of Rickerton is is, is integral in, in 
your ability to travel and move through the city. Yes. Your button again, please. And particularly, see, in the central Rickerton area, 48% of the population is ethnic Asian. And these people, particularly the older people, use the buses frequently. Um, it's really important that there are buses. I mean, the very suggestion of closing the lounges has raised the question, where are people going to have any shelter or seating on Rickerton Road? Your point's well made. Any other questions? No, there aren't. Garth, so thank you very much for coming and taking the time this morning to go through your submission with us. Our next uh, submitter is John McKim. Is John here? Oh, you are, John. And just the right hand button, John, when you're ready. Just. Uh, thank you very much for being able to appear before the Joint Committee. Uh, I'm known for my bluntness, so please don't get offended. Um, my qualifications are I'm an instrumentation and process control engineer and have been so, I'm clocking up nearly 50 years now, so I'm becoming ancient. Um, the, the first subject that I'd like to address is re uh, the last one of the last hearings I appeared in relationship to the increase of uh, ECAN's levy on moorings in the uh, in the ECAN area. And we were told that that amount uh, would be doubled. Um, I asked for figures to justify that, and I really, up to date, haven't received any. But anyway, that's water under the bridge. Now, I'd like to pose a question to every member of the panel, and the answer is uh, relatively simple. And you'll wonder where I'm heading with this, but trust me, it's relevant. Uh, if, my ha if my house burnt down and I didn't insure it and I came round to any of the members of the council, would you pay to have my house reinstated? Now, anybody who would please raise their hand. I see a vacancy of hands. Now, where I'm heading with this is that we've now been told that ECAN is going to put a $50 a year levy on all moorings. Now, I'm very much opposed to that, and so are a lot of other people in the uh, yachting community. Now, quite simply, uh, we have to insure our boats. I have no option. I, current, I have, currently have a mooring in Puria, and I also uh, spend most of my time with the boats mostly parked in Littleton in the new marina, purely because my partner, uh, she's older than I am, I'm just a toy boy, and... Um, she finds it easier to get onto the boat and she you know she just sits there and watches the world go by so she's quite happy doing that now i fail to see if i'm prepared to insure my vessel which it is insured um if, interestingly enough out the 200 nautical miles because this is a large ocean going yacht and no i'm not rich i'm just a poor pensioner but if i'm prepared to insure my vessel why should i pay an extra levy to support those who are not prepared to insure those. Now, the answer to this is quite simple. If you, for, to have my boat in the marina, I have to present a, an insurance certificate each year to LBC to prove that the vessel is insured, which I do, obviously, otherwise I can't stay there. Now, what I'm saying to ECAN is that if I can produce a certificate each year to, to my vessel, on that mooring, which is only there occasionally per hour, then I should be exempt from that because I have carried out my, uh, whatever you want to call it, to the community at large to ensure that my vessel is insured. Should it sink, it's not going to cost ECAN any money. Now, I've had a discussion with the regional harbour master and he's explained to me the costs involved and they are quite substantial. And recently, we've had a number of vessels that have had to be recovered, and uh, the cost is pretty alarming. So I can see why you want to build up a fund to help offset this. But I fail to see why um, a person who has insured their vessel has to pay yet another levy just because there are a group of people that don't. And some of the boats are in pretty shocking condition. In fact, it amazes me at times that some of them are still floating. But this is the point that I make. 
about the insurance issue. And I would like, when you respond to me, I'd like to have some sort of response that indicates that you've taken on board what, what I'm saying here today. Now, the second part of my submission uh, relates to the uh, consents that he can issue. Now, I'll be blunt here. Uh, amongst those of us that are in the marina, ECAN has become a joke. Um, there are discharges from the uh, dry dock. They are numerous and quite damaging. Now, I'd like to, I know you won't, but I would like to invite you all to come down to your car park, just down here, and look at my car. It is covered in white paint. Now, I have another car, which I occasionally used to go there. It's covered in white paint as well. There was a very expensive Porsche covered in white paint. Now, we have to go and chase the contractors to get these things rectified. We should not have to do that. Now, the reason I mentioned about instrumentation, I'm well aware of what it's involved in consents and what instrumentation you have to have in order to enforce consents, etc. Now, when we ring ECAN, and I've given up doing it, and so have a lot of other people, we get told that I'm sorry we don't have anyone that can come out. Now, you can't close the gate after the horse has bolted. And I did a quick survey around the, the car park the other day and found nine vehicles that were covered in paint in various stages of uh, just side panels, mine is the windows, the side panels, the whole lot. And I, I understand that the Porsche that was damaged cost nearly 9000 to rectify. So, again, what I'm saying is that you people need to get your act together to make sure that these consents are enforced. Obviously, as a yacht, I've got wind measuring equipment and it's pretty accurate. I have seen them painting in up to 20 knots. Now, to the best of my knowledge, I think, if I, and you'll correct me, I'm sure if I'm wrong, that this wind speed uh, for painting there is eight knots, eight to 10 knots. And that, in fact, is actually too fast anyway. So what happens is that they paint, they're using epoxy-based paints, which um, take a while to go off. Like if you use a lacquer-based paint, it virtually goes off when it hits the air. But epoxy-based paints don't, and they form in droplets. They travel the long distance, I know, because I use this type of paint myself. And so, hey, presto, you've got a painting car for free. LPC do not want to know about it. They pass the buck to you guys. Now, I believe that LPC, at a bare minimum, have a duty of care towards us. We are paying, uh, and again, being a poor pensioner, we pay nearly $8,000 a year to keep our boat in there. That's a hell of a lot of money. It's a big dent in our income, and we can't get a government grant for that. But... The thing that I'm saying here is that please, let's be positive about this. If you're, we, we keep reading about how ECAN is, you know, is so much for the environment. There are ways to mitigate this, as I've pointed out to LPC in re recent communications. Overseas, you ask any of the yachties that have been overseas, they will tell you that if that sort of thing happened overseas, all of the, one minute, all of the vessels would be covered with plastic. Now, LPC pointed, made this point themselves when they replaced the, um, the light on the end of one of the moles. They covered it in plastic so they could work on it. Now, why can't we have that sort of thing put into your consents to say that these vessels must be covered? OK, it might put ten or 20000 on the cost of the, the job, but they're going to end up paying that if we can nail them to the floor. In, in restoration of vehicles and boats. I mean, I've had sandblasting dust all inside my boats and I've, and I've had to rip out navigational instruments and repair them. Now, that's fine. I can do that. I'm qualified to do it. But if it was someone else, they'd have to pay me a hell of a lot of money to do it. And that's, I think, we really need to get our act together over there. And I'm not the only grumpy yacht owner. <laughs> There's a hell of a lot of us. <laughs> John, John, can I just... Um... Can I just interrupt then? We're just about out of time, but I know you're not the only grumpy yacht owner because there's about 20 of them that have submitted to us. And I guess, I guess on that subject, we'll get um, we'll get um, some more submissions, some more um, in front of us. But um, on the other issue, that's news to me, so we'll take that under consideration. We've got time for a, a small clarification question. 
You've made your point, John. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for being able to appear before the committee, and I hope that the communications you send me at the end will post uh, some clarification on what you intend to do. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to, to what I'm going to do now is that we'll take. Uh, I think we've got a federated farmers submission next, uh, and then we will take a break. But we will hear Peter Peter Richardson and Aotearoa Water Action Peter at quarter two. We'll come back at quarter two. Uh, so it's up to the councillors how long they'll have for a break. So David Clark. <coughs> and Chris, good to see you. Good morning, councillors. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to our submission that we have um, based on the long term plan. We we're very much value the opportunity to be able to come and speak to you all. So with me this morning, I've got Chris Allen and Nick Clark. Um, my name is David Clark. I am the Mid Canterbury Provincial President of Federated Farmers. Um, I myself am an arable farmer in Mid Canterbury. I'm a seed grower. I grow the seeds that begin your food, your food journey. So Chris here on my left is a sheep and beef farmer. And Nick, um, Nick Clark's our general manager of policy. We're going to call him today our honorary dairy consumer for the day. Um, an apology from Lionel Hume, who is the writer of our uh, author of our submission. Lionel is presenting expert evidence in Otago this morning, so was unable to be here. And Jason Grant, the chair of our provincial policy committee, was also unable to be here. So an apology for him as well. So federated farmers in mid Canterbury across the, the north, mid south Canterbury, North Otago provinces represent approximately 3,000 um, members of federated farmers, being a voluntary organisation. Um, we widely canvass our submissions to district and regional plans, and there's opportunity for all members to have input into the viewpoints that we have taken. So we would like we would respectfully ask that this is looked upon as a submission representing 3,000 farmers from your area that you represent. So what we're picking up is there's a lot of angst within the rural community about the proposals that, that have been presented, and in particular the, the scale of the rate rises for rural areas and the, the dollar quantum um, on farming businesses. So that disappointment has, has been very clearly articulated through to us. Um, and one of those one of those key points that people are making is that farmers shouldn't be looked upon as being a never ending source of revenue for a regional council. So some farmers in our area are facing um, from 50 to 120 and 130 percent rate increases. Uh, my own rates personally go up from twelve thousand dollars to eighteen and a half thousand dollars. So it's a significant impost in our own business. Now we have no ability to recover that in what we sell. Absolutely no ability whatsoever. So no business in our society has the luxury of an unlimited income stream, but nor should a regional council be any different to that. Now, what I would ask too is that Chris Allen and I both put in personal, personal submissions to your long-term plan. Now we have given that we weren't expecting to be presenting here today, we both waive our right to uh, speak to our own personal submissions, but I would respectfully ask that you um, pay a read those submissions and take into account what we have expressed personally as well. It's interesting, Chris and I were reflecting um, on our journey up this morning. We did carpool, so we are being conscious of our, our footprint. <laughs> Um, we were reflecting as we drove up here this morning that um, 11 or 12 years ago, Chris and I um, appeared before the then Canterbury Regional Council. And um, what we saw there was that um, the council as it was, there'd become a disconnect between the urban faction of the Regional Council and the wider Can Canterbury province. And, and the relationship between the wider province and the Regional Council had become quite dysfunctional. Um, I hope we're not in a situation after half a term of an elected council that we're back in that situation now, but that's certainly the feeling and the feedback that we're getting from our farmers. If you leave a community behind, the risk is that environmental gains that are being made may slow or be lost. So 
the progress of the Canterbury Land and Water Plan uh, has been, I think, quite something we all should be very proud of. There's been 60 or $70 million of, of the community's money spent on developing this plan. And it's put us on a trajectory of constant improvement on what is occurring across all of Canterbury and particularly in rural areas. So let's reflect on the fact that prior to the Canterbury Land and Water Plan, there was effectively no caps on nutrient discharges on farms in Canterbury. There was no limits. You can do pretty much what you pleased. So we've come an awful long way in the last 10 years. We've got a plan now that has been through a great deal of consultation over a four year period. It's got buy-in from our rural communities. It's got farmers engaged in what the problems are in our areas. And it sets some very ambitious targets that are gonna take an awful lot of achievement. But farmers are on board with that, they're engaged with that and we're making progress. But it has come not only at a 60 or $70 million cost to the ratepayer, but also huge on-farm costs and changes to farm, and farm systems and compliance regimes that we now all face, but farmers are on board with us. Now that progress includes overseer uh, nutrient loss modelling, farm environment plans, land use consents. We have come a very long way, and I certainly look at my own business as a seed grower, um, the, the awareness we have now on, on what our environmental footprint is in comparison to what we, we had and the transitions that we've done in agronomy and our infrastructure, moving to centre pivots, moving away from rotor rainers, reducing our water use, reducing our nitrogen loss. So, so those sub-regional plans have put us on that trajectory. Those plans have got some years to run, but I would argue here today with you that rewriting those plans at a cost of $25 million to the wider Canterbury community isn't going to change or improve the environmental outcomes that we're going to get over the course of those plans. We're already moving as fast as, as is possible out, out in the rural community, changing the end point before those plans mature isn't actually going to achieve us anything. And I think that's a, that's a real risk um, and comes at a huge cost. So in our view, ECAN should be defending the current plan and the targets that are had in place. And those targets obviously will be readdressed when those plans mature. Uh, but we are on a trajectory that is going to have us heading in the right direction to be meeting Freshwater 2020. We would ask that you exercise financial discipline and limit rate rises to the to the uh, level of inflation across community, which is which is the expectation that we have across all businesses across our society, and that that's what makes up inflation. So we don't see why the regional council should be able to, to head down an expansionary plan uh, way out of step with the rest of society. So we would we would ask for you to to go back through your the details of your plan and look to see where you could exercise that financial discipline. So on the on the finer details, I'll hand over to Nick. Oh, thank you, David. I'll be very very quick because I understand that you guys are running to a pretty tight time frame, and we'd probably like to make up some time. Um, look, Lionel's Lionel Hume's submission basically covers our concerns very well, um, and and on what we what we'd like to see. As David said, we need to get. Um, spending um, increases down close to the rate of inflation. We'd like to see council focus on relentless focus on value for money. That spending should be targeted, controlled and phased over the decade. Prioritisation has to be key. Um, there aren't too many people in the community who will be getting a 24% salary increase this year. Option two might be the better approach in terms of um, this basically doing what you have to do, particularly this year as we're recovering from COVID and the economic impacts that have, that have resulted from that. There seems to be a tendency to front load spending in years one and two with more modest increases in out years. And we were wondering whether that spending can be smoothed over the course of the decade. Um, there will be operating surpluses for each year over the next decade. Uh, debt will be, remain pretty modest over the decade. Um, and you know, compared to a lot of other councils around the country, regional and district. So, you know, could could we look at trying to, um, you know, smooth the rates of, rates burden by maybe, um, you know, making sure that capital spending is, is debt funded rather than rate funded effectively. Um, and that maybe the surpluses could be paired back a little bit over time as well. And this would certainly help with smoothing the rates impact in our view. 
The other issue, UAGC, around $40, I think, if I remember rightly. Um, there should be scope to increase that, especially for activities that benefit everyone equally. And um, Lionel in his submission makes the point that perhaps biosecurity could be more funded through the UAGC. So look, I'll, um, I'll cut myself short now and hand over to Chris. Thanks very much for having us as well. And um, yeah, just coming up on the car today, reflecting with David, it wasn't a pretty experience. And um, but when you tick that box, you just think, oh, where are we coming up to? And um, every now and then we give ourselves a bit of a nudge, but this is the first time we've been sort of co-presenting sort of, so uh, hopefully it goes much better today. Anyway, I'll just bring it back to a quote that I was part of the Biodiversity Collaborative Group. And there was a submission that Environment Canterbury made to us, this is only three years ago. And the quote was, don't get between us and our landowners. And that was to a, a directive to the Biodiversity Collaborative Group. The relationship that ECAN is forming with its farmers has taken a long time. ECAN got well offside with it, and it took a generation. David Parker talks a generation. It's taken 20 years to get re-establish that, that connection again. And you might think it's just something as simple as a rates issue, but once you start eroding that um, capital, capital that you've built up, it will take you a long time to build it back up again. So that, there's one thing that we come back to. Okay, so there's a lot that goes on in our environment at the moment around engineered solutions. Managed Act for Recharge is an engineered solution. Using the likes of 1080 for possum control is an engineered solution. Putting a, a fence around a piece of bush, it's an engineered solution. These things don't look after themselves. So just when it comes to working about our priorities as a community, we need to make sure that engineered solutions are not off the agenda. And the, one of the key themes I'd like to leave you with is you've got to take your community with you the whole way through this journey. And you might say it's a 10 year plan, but if you can't um, make it over the next 12 months, when there's a potentially a 25% rates increase, and I don't know who these ones are, they're going to get the 25% rates increase, but most of us are well above that. Um, and the tool that you put out there, we might have mentioned to Ekan uh, about a couple of months ago, it hasn't been fixed up till the night before when we're writing out a submission, it's still way off beam. And I don't know how you can do public consultation with a, with a tool that's just so far out of whack. For farmers, we need flexibility, but we need certainty. And I, I, we've got some certainty with the land and water plan at the moment, but we also need the, that flexibility so that we can adapt and pick up new sciences and innovations on the way through. So the rest of the, all of what we want to say is covered in the submission, but we really urge you to have a really good hard look and make sure that you do prioritise because we can't do everything the same. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, David, uh, Chris and Nick. Um, and thank you, Lionel, for his submission. I have read it and, and I have read yours. And thank you for uh, waving your right to come back uh, and have another crack at us. Um, look, I've, from what I've heard from you this morning, you've been pretty, pretty directive in terms of what you think uh, as an organisation. I don't see why there could be questions of clarity, but if there are questions of clarity, we'll ask one. Has anyone got a question? Uh, Councillor Clearwood. Thank you for your submission and um, drawing our attention to the rate issue. And like you'll be aware that, and the, as you said, the average increase is 25% 20, average. So I, and, but that's in Christchurch, for example, as you'll be aware, that's based on a property valuation of about less than $600. So I'm just wondering if you're able to, where there's very large increases like those that you've quoted, if you might be able to, to give us an approximate um, figure around the, the valuation part of the of the rate increase. So by you seeking to, so I'm curious, by you seeking to understand the rating valuation of a farm, are you trying to, to draw a, a, some sort of um, correlation to the ability of the farmer to pay that on what the capital value of the farm is? I'm just not quite sure what. I think, we'll, um, I think we'll, we won't get into a debate here. Just a straight question. Just, you know, average valuation of a farm that's got a 80 to 90% increase. Sorry. Dave, sorry. So a farm in the eight ten million dollar bracket 
um, suffering a, a significant increase along those sort of lines, um, has no more ability to pay than somebody who lives in a $2 million house in Christchurch. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we could go on with this, but we'll be here all day. And councillors have got 10 minutes for a cup of tea. And then uh, when we come back, uh, Aotearoa Water will be on at quarter two. So thanks again for coming to see us. And Welcome. And just as uh, councillors uh, come to the table, uh, my name's John Sunkel. I will be chairing the next two sessions. And if I could ask Peter Richardson and Aotearoa Water to come to the table, just as everyone's getting settled, please. We have all our councillors now in place, except Ian, who is coming. With expediency, we'll let you start, uh, Peter. You're aware of the button to push and 10 minutes of speaking and a couple of questions at the end. If you may start, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, Chair and councillors, uh, first, just by way of introduction, I want to say we do genuinely wish you all the best um, in what we see as a very difficult task. Um, we think you've inherited a planning, planning framework that essentially has prioritised economic growth at the expense of ecological wisdom, and that we continue to reap the, uh, reap the outcomes of that in Canterbury. Um, and we sincerely hope, therefore, that you'll lead the development and implementation of a long-term plan that signals transformational changes in the way we relate to land and water in Canterbury. That also results in better environmental outcomes and also doesn't accentuate but helps to heal the divisions in our community. So dealing with uh, our first submission, our first slide, um, looking at level of service one in the um, uh, in the draft, Alwa would like to see <laughs> council allocate sufficient funding to overhaul the planning documents. I know we've just had a submission from uh, Federated Farmers, which basically um, indicates their support for a continuation of the existing planning approaches. Uh, particularly around nitrate loss, I assume, we would say that um, the existing documents are insufficient uh, to use as a guide or template to what needs to happen in Canterbury. Um, the government's uh, freshwater strategy has brought about a new paradigm, and particularly an order of priorities that requires that we put the health of the water first, including our aquifers, we put the health needs of people second, including the right to clean and uncontaminated drinking water, and that economic considerations are now in a third order of priority. I'm talking about Tamana to Y here, specifically the order of priority in that document, and that economic considerations are not prior prioritised ahead of social or cultural considerations. So what we're dealing with is a new paradigm, and we don't believe that the existing planning documents represent central government's approach to the management of water anymore. The Canterbury Water Management Strategy now has no statutory authority since the repeal of the legislation, um, which was introduced at the time that Canterbury lost its democratic rights. The contents, uh, we would say, are inconsistent with the government's freshwater strategy and community expectations. And again, the Canterbury Water Management Strategy shouldn't be treated as any sort of basis for a rewrite of the planning documents and the rules. We believe a bold approach is needed, and that approach must also ensure greater community input into decision making on applications, particularly applications that affect or may affect people's health and well-being. So I'll go on to slide two. So this is around um, monitoring particularly. We would say that there's been a over-reliance on modelling and an under-reliance on monitoring to date, and we would like to see council fund and prioritise monitoring ahead of modelling. 
We want to see council invest in far more frequent and transparent monitoring, uh, particularly bore monitoring and more regular analysis and public dissemination of the results. We believe independent involvement is required and also significant stakeholder involvement at every step, including selection of sites, uh, the actual monitoring and the analysis in order to overcome what we see as a significant trust deficit um, in the in the assessment of the effects of the way in which we're managing our land and water. So we would like to see modelling de-emphasised as a useful tool for setting and measuring environmental targets and effects. Our and many other groups have no particular faith in overseer as a modelling tool. We're aware of its flaws, we're aware of the conflicts involved in overseer. There is a widespread lack of community trust and we believe there's a capacity for um, results to be gained. And I imagine there's people in this room who are aware of the way in which Overseer has been gamed to produce certain results in the past. We believe that if modelling is to continue to be used as a tool, then Council should itself invest in or participate in the development of truly independent and credible modelling tools. So the next slide um, deals with the freshwater regula regulatory framework. I want to speak in particular to um, paragraph two, uh, subparagraph so three of that slide at the moment. Local government New Zealand recently adopted a resolution calling for a moratorium on the grant of further water bottling consents until a proper regulatory framework could be established. Now that's far from being established. So ECAN is part of a group that has called for that moratorium and we would like to see ECAN give effect to that, to give practical effect to it in the way that it writes its rules in the new plan. We remind uh, councillors that, I'll point out that export water bottling offends the first and second priorities of Tamanaro Tawai, and particularly the second and that it potentially puts at risk the public right to drinking water security for generations to come. It also offends the first of the six principles of Tamana Otawai, that of mana whakahaere, or the power or authority and obligation of tangata whenua to make decisions that maintain, sustain and protect the health and well-being of and their relationship with fresh water. And if you want to know specifically how export water bottling offends these principles, I'll simply refer you to the affidavit of Dr. Ricky Toe, which was filed in support of Naitu Akuriri's involvement in our challenge to the Belfast water bottling consents. And that affidavit sets out in some details, some detail, um, the way in which export water bottling offends that right, or the right of mana whenua in relation to water management and the authority over water. I'd like to remind councillors that there are many industrial water bottling consents in Christchurch in particular that could be very readily turned into water bottling consents. These are industrial consents that are by and large not used or they're only very partially used. They could be turned into water bottling consents and they could be used 24 seven and maximum take could in practice be taken. The conditions could be changed to allow water to be taken under those consents from our deepest drinking water aquifers without public notification as happened at Belfast. And so we need to write rules, council needs to write rules to ensure that this doesn't happen and that we meet community expectations in this regard. Our believes that council should set aside funding specifically to address this issue, um, including obtaining appropriate legal advice on how this can be done. And it needs to involve stakeholders such as Awa and Naitu Ahuriri. So looking at the next slide, uh, level of service nine, good management practices. We um, we would urge council to adopt, if it's going to adopt management practices at all, to adopt best management practices, uh, particularly for dairy farming, because the challenges associated with change in the climate, the, with climate change and the changes in central government policy uh, require that we do 
adopt better practices than we have to date. And because central government has now recognised and is starting to push the need for regenerative farming, and we believe, we believe there is also a need to investigate alternative land uses. Um, unlike federated farmers, Awa does not have a great deal of confidence that the measures in the current plan, particularly around nitrate loss, are or are going to result in significant improvements in environmental outcomes or indeed health outcomes. We believe the only viable approach which will result in certainty of outcome is reduction in cow numbers on the Canterbury Plains. And that will require either, but most likely both, a move to regenerative or transformative farming and alternative land uses. We would like to see ECAN, ECAN become a driver of that. We as a group, AWA, have um, entered into discussions with irrigation companies directly. We don't believe that this needs to result in farmers going broke. We would like to see that that's not the case. We want to support people's right to an economic livelihood on the plains. Uh, but we, we believe it can't be business as usual. Things need to change. Um, and we believe that regenerative farming and alternative land uses are probably the most viable options for that. And we'd like to see you can drive that. Final point um, in the slide, um, the Danish report. Uh, we'd like um, council to allocate further funds to investigate uh, what was written up in that report. And um, that report has come in for some criticism. Criticism. Awa has engaged directly with Dr. Jörg Schulner, who is one of the lead authors of that report. He said that those criticisms are probably a result of misunderstanding of that report, um, that there's nothing in that report that he would resile from, and that um, he would presumably back, um, back that up. So given the critical conclusions in that report, we'd say Council needs to address it. Thank you, Peter, for your submission on uh, behalf of Awa. Do we have any quick questions of clarification? Councillor Marshall. Sure, thank you very much for your submission. Um, just a question regarding your written submission, page five. Um, you proposed amendments to one of the performance measures to recollect, analyse and publish data instead of just collecting and publishing data. What sort of analysis were you looking for? Do you have any examples? And if just press your button to get the mic back, please. Uh, primarily independent analysis, and you know, there's various, um, there's various organisations and uh, academics uh, that could provide that independent analysis. So effectively, that would be analysis on where the trends are heading, what we're actually seeing on the ground. Are we seeing improvement? Are we likely to see improvement? Um, I'm talking about ball monitoring in particular. Um, what can we expect as a result of um, the present situation in terms of um, historical um, uh, nutrient losses to soils and to aquifers, and you know, are we are we actually seeing improvement, or are we seeing a worsening, or are we seeing the maintenance of the status quo? Not talking um, just about aquifers, I'm also talking about some um, stream ecology and the like as well. Yeah. One further question. Thank you. Uh, in your submission, you talk about the order of the RPS and the Land and Water Regional. Plan and, the, and the notification of those coming together in 2024, but you talk about that not necessarily being possible or the right way of doing things. Would you care to explain a bit more? Yeah, happy to do that. And I didn't, um, just through time constraints, I didn't really have a chance to address that in the written submission, but um, the way we read, read the uh, proposals at the moment is that the um, perhaps the regional policy statement, but in any event, the, the policy framework is going to underline, underline the plans is to be undertaken at the same time as the actual LWRP and the rules. We would like to see the policy framework established very clearly in advance because it's not much point writing a plan if you don't know where you're coming from in terms of your policy framework. So we see that as the priority. And we'd, we'd like to see that policy framework in place by at least 2023 so that we can launch into the writing of the plan and the rules uh, by 2024 in accordance with um, the freshwater management strategy and the requirement. Thank you, Peter, for a strong and uh, submission, well thought out, which everyone uh, has the ability to, to further read and contemplate. Thank you. Uh, I now ask uh, Deanna Walsh to come forward. Good 
morning. I'm Deanna Walsh. I'm a fan owner operator with my husband in Ashburton. Um, my submission, um, or what I'm speaking on, is focused on the financial management. The unreasonable expectation of spending ECAN has in this proposed long term plan and the associated increase in rates, the significant impact it will have on our budget and operations, and the disregard for those expected to more heavily foot the bill. In the 15 years we have farmed here, the changes to our compliance requirements have been substantial. We've invested significantly in on-farm improvements, as have all farmers, as the various new compliance requirements from both central and local government bodies have been implemented. In addition to the on-farm investment for these requirements is the regular cost of compliance through maintaining the improvements made, the need of professional consultants, regular audits, standard charges for consents which are on a steady increase, particularly after the changes to fees and charges recovery policy, and the ever-increasing rates charges. We've also invested in on-farm improvements by choice to add efficiencies to our farming operation with relevant cost-benefit analysis. We've completed this all working within our budgets. As has been expressed by other submitters, the rates rises proposed are disproportionately targeted at the rural sector. Though your discussion document refers to an average option one increase of 24.5% for the first year alone, we are facing a 79.5% increase. To be fair, we're possibly on the lower side of the many reported increases for farmers, with plenty of examples of increases in excess of 100%. Would you expect or demand of urban Canterbury residents a rates increase of anything near 100%? Why do you present it as reasonable to propose the overall increase in rates of this degree due to the proposed overall increase in spending? No business or individual can simply decide to increase their spending and decide to increase their income to cover it. As mentioned in my submission, the Local Government Act stipulates that a local authority must have regard to Section 101, Financial Management, and must manage its revenue, expenses and general financial dealings prudently and in a manner that promotes the current and future interests of the community. The proposed expansive long-term plan spending and associated rates increases doesn't demonstrate prudent financial management particularly when you entertain the concept of borrowing to cover working expenses. As other submitters have raised, you hold your position to represent all of the community from all sectors. This is reinforced in the Local Government Act, as previously mentioned, operating in a manner that promotes the current and future interests of the community. The impact this LTP is to have with a heavy financial burden on the rural sector versus minimal financial burden on the urban sector is in stark contrast to this requirement. The average rates increase of 24.5% as stated in the consultation document and the many reported cases of increases much greater than this across the rural sector highlights this inequity and clearly demonstrates that the burden is skewed. To spread the burden, a fair use of the UAGC could be applied, increasing this to, for example, $80 per property, which would in turn reduce the general rates increase. This would also be a better reflection of the purpose behind the UAGC, funding the people-focused activities. Further, this LTP is in part an expensive rebranding of the Canterbury Land and Water Regional Plan in an effort to comply with essential freshwater policy. The Land and Water Regional Plan already works towards essential fresh water, and no amount of money can speed up the natural process of improved waterways and water sources. A significant investment, the vicinity of 60 million, was spent to establish the Land and Water Regional Plan, and by rewriting it in this long-term plan, you are disregarding the cost, time and effort already invested by ratepayers, ECAN staff and the community. Do you consider it prudent financial management to override this significant cost, spend a further 30 to 40 million to implement a new plan, which essentially achieves the same thing? And how much are we going to have to redo on farm to comply with the same program under a different name, but with another round of associated costs? Regardless of who's footing the bill for this long-term plan, the significant spending plans need to be paired back as the proposed increased spending and increase in rates is too great for a reasonable budget expectation. 
To use the words of Federated Farmers, this is not the time for dreams and schemes. For our small business, the proposed rates increase is 79.5%, just over 3,000 in year one alone. If our increase is so much higher in year one compared to the average 24.5 publicised, then what are the increases going to be across each of the years? Compared to five years ago, our total rates and consent costs had increased by 45%, over $3,800 in the last financial year. One year had an increase of 60% with the requirement for a farm environment plan, which required hiring a professional consultant, the subsequent process of and paying for a resource consent to farm. Of course, we've since had audits that we've also paid for. These constantly increasing demands on the farming budget are unsustainable. And as the consent and rating costs increase, that means less is available to spend on on-farm improvements. We've even been lucky enough to join the Federated Farmers 10K Rates Club for our combined district and regional rates being over 10,000 a year. Bear in mind, these cost increases don't include the capital expenditure for plant and equipment on farm to comply with the various regulations. As I said earlier, we are a small family run farming business. Our teenage daughter is keen to be a farmer and already takes an active role in on farm work. What future is there for her in farming if the industry is going to be rated and consented to oblivion? And what interest will there be for her if farming continues to be more in the office than in the paddock? As per my original submission, I do not support either option one or two of this long-term plan. As a note, our water was recently tested and the nitrate level is less than two and our farm audit rating was an A. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, clear again and concise uh, submission on, on your views and values. Do I have any questions of clarification from council members? Councillor Southworth. Yeah, thank you for your submission. I'd just like to ask how how you you said that um, the rural ratepayers are subsidising a bit are subsidising urban ratepayers, and I'm just could you expand a bit on that and what and how how do you mean that like in what way um i didn't use the term subsidizing but i did say that the on the submission apologies um it's the fact that the rural rate increases are significantly more than in the urban sector um yet as been previously expressed um and i agree with it we um in the urban area are not getting the benefit for the much greater rates increases um, and also in terms of um, what goes on in the um, rural area we're paying for everything to comply with environment needs anyway so paying for it again in rates when we're paying for consents we're paying for monitoring um, and paying for audits and all of that sort of thing um, it's we're getting stung with the cost multiple times Are there any further questions? If not, thank you for the time coming up and making your submission. Thank you. I now call Annabelle Hesselman from the Apawaho Hathcote River Network. Morning, everyone. I'm Annabelle, Chair of the Apawaho Hathcote River Network, and this is Kia ora, I'm Rachel Barker. So I just really want to say, uh, um, start off by saying thank you. Thank you to the Regional Council for all the, um, their support of the Opawa Heathcote River Network over the over the last year, for your provision of networking for the environment and the really effective um, zone committee, Kashmir Stream and Port Hills Working Group. Um, thank you for signing, being committed to and signing the Community Water Partnership for the development of Mayuru Rapel project within the um, and community funding within the long-term plan option one. For support for reporting on Matauranga Māori alongside State of Environment reporting, the continual support for community groups and information sharing, and the support in the long-term plan for youth engagement in Enviro schools. Who are we? We're, we're a community catchment, urban community catchment group with a vision of an ecologically healthy river that people take pride in, care for and enjoy. And we look to do that by facilitating a collaborative network of over 20 community groups with, along in the whole catchment um, of the Opawa River. 
Why are we doing this? Basically, we've, we've become a voice for the Apaoho, and we're doing it because we care deeply. We care deeply about restoring the health in Maui of the river. We care about connecting the community around the river, and we care about advocating for the river. And the way we do this, we're like an Oreo cookie. We're the bit in the middle, and, the, and an essential bit of the cookie and that we connect between the doers, all the community groups on the ground and the governance level. And it's all about relationships and communication. So our network supports a time when Naitahu presence is expressed, where the river is on it, the awa is on it. Um, Māori, Mahiga Kai and Wairua are replenished and flourishing, and a time when Manaki Tanga is practised. So the Naitahu values are upheld and visible along the river. Um, we'd like to point out that the network has 20 river groups and community groups, some of them small, some of them larger, and they're all active. Active about monthly working bees and extending from Kashmir Stream down through Family Reserve right down to the Ihu Tai. So it's, um, it's an active little catchment or big catchment. Um, the river groups and the network are looking forward to ongoing programs to improve the health of, it, of the most degraded river in Christchurch, the Opawaho Hedgut. So basically, I mean, we're a voice for the river and we're going to continue being a voice for the river until because the Opawaho Hedgut River is the most degraded river, as Rachel has said, in Christchurch. And it needs to be identified as a priority river. It's got urban stream syndrome. It comes from the springs, and then as it passes the industrial, residential, and the um, through the Port Hills and Kashmir Stream, its quality deteriorates. Um, we really need. There's a huge amount of focus on the Avon Otakaro, and we really need attention on the Opawaho Heathgate River. So we we were seeking the development of a catchment management plan, a, a collaborative process to develop that and bring community on board with that, to commit for the ECAN to commit to some key actions on the issues around sediment storm and stormwater within this urban river, and actions on biodiversity and weeds within the river catchment. One of the key issues, as I'm sure you're all aware, is that is sediment in the river, and. Um, the, the priority needs to be within the, the Port Hills and the um, Kashmir Stream. There's been a really successful zone committee um, working group, and we look forward to the ongoing work of this group and the recommendations that have come out of that. We're seeking prior, priority from the council to uh, get around monitoring and compliance and enforcement of sediment discharges, training for the industry, a focus on revegetating the Port Hills and identifying, I know there's some work being done to identify high erosion zones within um, the Port Hills. And we really need the loop to be continued of ongoing reporting back to the community of what's happening and, um, and to the community groups around this issue. And here you can see this is a common Im image that many of you be aware of, where the Kashmir stream joins into the Opawaho as it comes from uh, from the spring and it comes past the industrial area and there's a huge sediment load that comes in here at this confluence. Stormwater is a key contaminant and um, it can to recognise the potential of working with river care community groups to um, relate to the residential um, area and also for ECAN to maintain a lead role and to develop that role in the community water partnership around this issue. We, um, ECAN are going to be um, monitoring the City Council global stormwater consent, so we really you know, ask for you to uphold those conditions and the consent, and the stormwater management plan is going to be signed off by ECAN, so the whole process and involving community within that conversation. And here is the lower river, just that image of a huge stormwater drain feeding into a very polluted river. I um, want to thank um, ECAN for the work to develop the, with the City Council and others to develop the Stormwater Superhero Trailer. What a wonderful interactive resource. Um, it's a great way of communicating with the public and it's something that we need more of. We need more of these innovative ways to get our message out there and, um, and to the urban population around these issues. And it drew 
everyone from children, parents to grand um, grandparents. And I think it's yeah an, an example to be continued and to do more work around these ideas. Many people, many people will be aware that Opawahu, um Heathcote is um, prone to weeds, but it's a designated site of ecological significance. Um, the weed management needs to be governed by an overarching principle that it's an ecological system. We look from that issue of you know managing from source to sea and um, looking for more management on, on weeds. So we think that ECAN and the City Council could um, work together on a weed management plan for the whole of the catchment. And we'd like ECAN to support that whole management approach of an ecological corridor. And I'd like to give you some examples in the next couple of slides. So um, like the Otakaro Avon, the yellow flag iris on the left is very prominent. A weed that you may not, well, if you come to the lower river, you'll be very aware of this weed, which is the reed um, sweet grass. And I will show you what our management slide is um, happening in the low river. This reed sweetgrass, it's worth knowing this, it's an aggressive mat-like plant which forms those dense um, monoculture and it spreads right across the river. Um, if it had the chance, it would join across the other side and um, in parts and it replaces all other species. So it really is um, quite... Um, a substantial plant to maintain. And we seek ECAN's help and support on that. So there's real potential along the river to... <laughs> With all the community groups, this is in the lower river, this is amazing planting that's happening along there. And there's also been the City Council, working with City Council has also done a lot of work with their bank restoration. So I really, we just really want to say thank you and um, there's a real opportunity, the focus on urban rivers, the Opawaho, the most degraded river. Let's all work together to restore our river, the Opawaho Heathcote River Network. Thank you very much for, you, for your presentation. We don't make statements, so I'm going to make one and just say you thank you for your work. As a, as a rural councillor, we often get the challenge what's happening in the city. I think this is a very, very clear indication of, of the work, the mahi that's going on in that space to, to try and bring this particular river back. So thank you for that. I have a question from Councillor Scott, uh, Megan Hands, and then uh, Councillor Farm. Thank you, Annabelle. Thanks. And thank you for the work you keep doing in the space. We keep seeing you, so um, which is great. Um, the sediment, the sediment uh, issue in your submission. You meant, mentioned the fact that it's still the complicating thing with that is falling between, I guess, ourselves and CCC because it mustn't. It, it's, it occurs outside of the stormwater network, and, and is that just the big rain event that makes that happen, or why is it that it's not in the stormwater? I think just the, the nature of the Port Hills and the lowest that just comes off it, that's just an erodible, it's just happening like the Kashmir Stream, even without a rain event, has a huge amount of sediment coming in. So I think it's, yeah, it's, we've got a very unstable landscape and we need to look at ways of um, managing that. Uh, th thank you, uh, John. Uh, Annabelle, um, great presentation, thank you. I I is there a significant issue in terms of urban people understanding their effect on the waterway? It, 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 do you get enough buy-in from the, a large enough community to support the work you're doing? Well, I think that's the potential. I think, you know, what is it, the huge rate, number of urban population of the, of the Canterbury area? And I think everyone's just hungry for the information and it's us, the ability for us to work in the, the community water partnership is a, a means of doing that, of working with the agencies and the community to be a voice to share that message. So there's huge potential, but like other catchment groups, we need support with all the agencies to do that. So I think it's just recognising what could happen. Yeah, thank you and congratulations on your work. Um, thanks for working so productively with Environment Canterbury and CCC. And I note that a bunch of your recommendations are really just directing our attention towards what you could interpret as doing our job. Um, the specific question I had was 
the only thing I picked up that was actually something you were asking for as a group was that three thousand um, dollars about the um, banner infographic about specific weeds. Everything else, are you comfortable that that is within Environment Canterbury and CCC, or or are there aspects of this that you feel like you could lead as a group? Sorry, I don't quite understand. So, oh, sorry, sorry. I mean, um, you're asking us to do this work. Do you feel like as a group, um, you have enough capacity and capability that, for example, you could be asking for the funding to do the work rather than it being sort of held within Environment Canterbury and CCC? Annabelle and I were talking about this yesterday, and I think it's worth, um, we were really looking at our financial management and how much it takes to project manage um, these these issues and, and the amount of work that we're doing. Um, we have a part-time project manager that um, we've costed out at around 15,000 that we were talking about yesterday, and that's a part-time person. So we're constantly seeking and finding ways for money from Rata Foundation through to anyone that we can source, but that's a realistic cost for us. So if we put our hand up to say that we want to do it, or we don't want to do it alone, we want to do it in partnership and collaboration, and I think that's the key thing. I don't think we can't take the responsibility, but I think it's, yeah. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Uh, always great to have you in here. Uh, our next uh, submitters are Otatahi Christchurch. And it's Colleen. Sure. Cool. Kia ora koutou, and thank you for taking all this time to listen to submitters, including Sustainable Auto Tahi Christchurch, or SOC, as we are often called. I want to first express our appreciation for so many of the Environment Canterbury staff that we have dealings with. You have some of the most skilled, knowledgeable, dedicated and ecologically oriented people in the region on your payroll. We know ECAN has the capacity to step up and show the leadership and demonstrate the duty of care for our natural world that we've been asking from you for years now. When we have felt this was not happening, we had to assume there was an institutional leadership issue. So thank you, councillors, for this LTP. Um, thank you to your chairperson for being bold enough and honest enough to point out the first year's headline cost in the introduction to the plan, i.e. the cost of option one, which is what SOC support. Thank you though for your statement of relativities. Yes, rates are a here and now issue for people, which we must be all cognizant of. However, the ongoing cost to current weight payers, as well as the intergenerational costs, if we fail to do even the reasonably modest actions outlined in this plan, must be weighed against this. We do hope you can borrow and also consider other options to perhaps offset the present time burden. The second major point we wish to cover here is our strong support for the funding for local work by community organisations. There is plenty of unmet need, so we would expect that fund to be well utilised. Indeed, we have work we expect we will apply to you for help with work that is complementary to the work ECAN does, just as our Speaking for the Planet project does. We with the New Zealand Association of Environmental Education run Speaking for the Planet, a speech, art, drama and spoken word competition for young people up to the age of 24, which uses as the topic the World Environment Day theme and is held as close as we can make it to World Environment Day. This is a continually improving and developing project which has been challenging for NZAEE and SOC to, to establish given our limited funds and would probably have floundered without ECAN's modest support in 2020 and 2021. Our initial funder SIFT was disestablished, although we were really fortunate to have their support in the inaugural year. The constant search for funding for work we know is valuable, even essential, is soul-destroying at times. 
So we are, en are enormously grateful for your support, but would like to point out that it is a very good investment when agencies like yours invest relatively modest amounts in the work done by third sector organisations, given, given how much our organisations bring to the table. Even before an application for funding is made, we have generally done a lot of planning, work, in-kind contribution, even invested financially in the project. The contribution of third sector organisations is often undervalued and disrespected due to it being largely voluntary. A change in attitude is needed. You speak of being a trusted partner. One way to become that is to be respectful of your partners. I recognise that many in your organisation already understand this and thank them for that. As I have said, SOC have already sought and received assistance from ECAN a number of times. The potential for speaking for the planet, we believe, is really significant. We have watched with delight the coalescence of the young people from around the region getting together with others, sharing their interests, values, hopes and dreams. Some winning entrants become eligible to enter an international speaking for the planet competition. We need to bring these young leaders forward. We note that within ECAN there does appear to be an understanding of the need for youth engagement and environment ed environmental education, and there is a focus on this within the LTP, which is pleasing to see. It is important that many initiatives are community led. But for all the strengths that we have in the third sector, we do still need the capacity, the resource that ECAN can bring to something, like Speaking for the Planet, to make it the very best it can be. It is also true that ECAN-led initiatives can be really valuable if they're well considered and done with full consultation with the third sector environmental organisations, as is the Networking for the Environment programme organised by Alison Bauer, the Partnerships Coordinator for ECAN. Bringing the connections and resources that ECAN has to the service of our environmental community and the way that Networking for the Environment is doing is proving to be a real success story. I think one of its strengths is that the learning and listening goes two ways. We are currently looking forward to a Networking for the Environment Forum in June, where our project, done in partnership with Eco Canterbury, collecting oral histories of pioneering, early but still living environmental leaders from Canterbury, will be presented alongside a similar project, Te Kahui Ta Ta'o, on more recent leadership in our sector, which has been led by Ali. I would like to speak more to the theme of building healthy coalitions generally. Environment groups and organisations across the four wellbeings have been consciously working to come together over the last several years. We have established network organisations. I refer you to One Voice to Rea Kotahi and you received an oral submission from last week. I have done this coming together, we have done this coming together in a flats roots way as we do not want this to be driven or led by agencies, however well-intentioned. We know we have challenges with this, not least the funding models we deal with, which have a tendency to work against cooperation and instead further competitiveness in our sector, but we are intent on working through these challenges. We urge that ECAN continue to think about your orientation to other agencies, particularly at local government level. A number of times recently, SOC have been involved with work that has needed input from ECAN and Christchurch City Council. We have felt a little bit like the matchmaker. There is definitely some work for you to do at the local government level to better engage with each other. And this work is just as necessary at the chalk phase as it is at the governance level. Perhaps one area of especial importance in this regard is in the delivery of public transport. With such a high proportion of the region's carbon emissions coming from vehicles, we need to get our people out of cars as much as is possible. And for this, we need a really joined up public transport system throughout the region. We also need a consciousness of urban design in all our large centres, including places like Rangiora and Rolleston. We cannot afford miscommunications and dysfunction between agencies when considering solutions. Another area where we need widespread collaboration to do what is necessary is in the marine space. 
about four years ago, I was asking if ECAN had some space, some staff working on marine matters and found that it was 0.5 of a full-time position. And then I believe the person was taken into a different role anyway. This is the UN decade of ocean science. We must all play a role in protecting and restoring our marine ecosystems and species within them. The Mōtiti decision reminds ECAN you have a role and responsibilities. These extend to 12 nautical miles, the edge of the terrestrial sea, not what many probably think of as coastal. Another aspect of the LTP of particular interest to SOG is pest control. We all know we have a biodiversity crisis, crisis in Canterbury, but we can have big wins in pest control if everyone works together. Indeed, weeds and other pests are something people find common ground with and can be a tool for bringing people closer to each other in a non-adversarial way. SOC has been assisting with an annual weed busting effort to support the Braided Rivers and the Arthurs Pass region, led on the ground by the Arthurs Pass Wildlife Trust and supported by a range of organisations, including conservation volunteers and the local branch of Forest and Bird. We also attended last year a weed forum initiated by the Waimakariri Environment and Recreation Trust, which was in large part an offshoot of this on the ground effort by volunteers from the array of community organisations. This forum brought together many relevant agencies, for example, LINS, DOC, ECAN, Selwyn District Council, LTSA, and a number of environmental organisations plus individuals, for example, station owners. It looks like it might lead to a step change in weed work in the Upper Waimakariri Basin. The role of ECAN staff in this has been and is critical, and we congratulate you on having people connected enough with community and able to seize these moments to help potentially affect significant change. Your LTP must allow for opportunities to be seized. We have faith in ECAN's ability on the ground. We have now more faith that the will to care, the will to back up your declaration of a climate emergency with real action, the will to lead is perhaps there. So congratulations on your LTP. The only proviso we have on this positivity is our desire that you know it is not enough in and of itself. And over the next 10 years, so critical for our regions, our planet's future, we must be open to more and to better. But I also hope our oral submission is making it abundantly clear that while funds are really important, it is not all about the money. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen, for, for that submission. Do we have any quick questions? We are short of time. Thank you. Cool. We give Councillor hands. Just a very quick question. At the study of submission you referred to, you, you hoped that we could use borrowing to smooth out um, the rates. Um, is there anything in particular that you think we should use borrowing for or shouldn't use borrowing for? I think to smooth out the intergenerational cost. And I think I will leave it to ECAN to make decisions around that. But most of the people I've spoken to think it's a no-brainer at the moment in this climate. Thank you. Councillor Mackay, quick question. Thank you. In your submission, you also note, and it's aligned with um, Councillor Hens, um, that, you know, you're not sure that we're even doing enough in option one, but then you go on to say that you understand that household budgets are limited and that rate increases must be small. What sort of figure are you looking for? It's, I'm not sure that I said they must be small. I, I'm just saying that we acknowledge that it is a burden on present day rate payers. And so that we have to be aware of that, yes, but there is an intergenerational cost that we have to be aware of as well. And we have a climate emergency. Thank you very much for your submission. Uh, we are due to break now, but we have three more submitters to get through. So my suggestion is if we could be really good with those three submissions and try and get them in by 25 past to give us a half hour break. So I now ask uh, Doug Rankin to come forward, please. Yes. And I will ask uh, Chief Executive just to make a comment before we start, once we are ready.
reflect earlier. Thank you, Stephanie. Mr. Rankin, I wanted to recognize that in your LTP submission, you've put in a, your submission to the PC7 hearings. I need to make it clear to councillors and council and yourself that it is separate independent commissioners who have heard the PC7 submissions, and this council is awaiting their recommendations. Uh, in that context, this is not to be considered or discussed in terms of PC7. That will come back to us in future, but rather your submission today needs to be done in the context of what is in the LTP consultation document, and that is to make sure that our council does not predetermine any outcomes with re regard to PC7. So my suggestion is that you focus today in your submission, Mr. Rankin, on things related to the LTP specifically. Thank you. Thank you. If you press your button when you're ready to go. Is that, can you all hear me? Cool. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Stephanie, for your comments. Um, I totally understand that. And uh, I'd just like to say good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, councillors, staff, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Douglas Rankin. I was born in Christchurch and live in Craycroft. I'm 68 years old and have been a keen kayaker and river runner and conservationist for most of my life. I'm a scientist and hold a BSc Honours and PhD in Chemistry from the University of Canterbury and have worked in world science in various areas for most of my professional life. In 1978, when I was a young married man heading over to the UK, all our rivers were pretty clean except we're severely polluted by point source discharges, especially from farm product processing industries. Water in most rivers was drinkable and suitable for swimming. There were no tox toxic formidium algal blooms. Most of our freshwater fisheries were healthy and vibrant. This is no longer the case. This deeply saddens me. How has this happened? Who has been responsible? Regional councils are charged with the responsibility of looking after these resources. Over the last 10 years, ECAN has conducted a region-wide experiment in land and water management. The Canterbury Water Management Strategy was supposed to provide holistic planning of resource use with the protection of the environment and sustainability as key cornerstones. This experiment has degraded and continues to degrade our freshwater environment in Canterbury and has ignored these key principles. ECAN has facilitated and expanded intensive dairy farming in Canterbury which has predictably led to the seriously degraded and disastrous freshwater outcomes expected. There is now serious nitrate pollution in lowland streams and rivers and groundwater, and rivers are often bereft of water. The science that predicted such an inevitable result has been completely ignored by ECAN. ECAN is now at a crossroads and you are on notice. Your organisation needs to regain the trust of the Canterbury urban and rural community. You as councillors must set ECAN on a pathway to fix the serious environmental problems ECAN has created. You cannot continue to ignore the science and data and observations that show the continued degradation of the regional land and water, freshwater environment and values. ECAN presumably does not want to lose what remaining credibility and mandate it has as a resource manager. I feel shame, grief and anger at the loss of and damage to our freshwater environment that ECAN has permitted and presided over. I am here to today to reflect on the science informing these views and persuade you to go down the pathway of regaining the community's trust and fixing these problems by starting with this long-term plan, embarking on and committing to a pathway necessary to rectify these past wrongs. What needs to happen? The LTP needs to have time-bound objectives and actions in the plan to rectify, for example, the demise of Christchurch's drinking water source. The current long-term plan does absolutely nothing to change this situation. I only see words, no measures to show improvements or a changing trajectory in environmental state and outcomes, for example. No measures to regulate, monitor and tightly control and reduce this pollution have been put in place. Your own scientific evidence, and I've tabled a paper as well um, with this um, 
material. I hope you will have a copy of it. If I don't, if you don't, uh, it can be forwarded to you. Shows that the water quality in Christchurch's groundwater aquifers will decline significantly as a result of the farming currently permitted and that recently proposed under Plan Change 7 in the adjacent Waimakariri River catchment. Nitrate concentrations will increase in all aquifers from which Christchurch obtains its currently safe, untreated drinking water. The nitrate levels will pose serious health risks. Are you prepared to accept responsibility for serious illnesses and deaths from increased colorectal and other cancers and responsibility for poor birth outcomes that will result? Who is prepared to pay to mitigate these adverse outcomes and costs? To farmers causing it, they should be. The citizens of Christchurch and those of the Waimakariri zone, they possibly should not. A new drinking water source will have to be found for the city at an estimated cost of over a billion dollars. If nothing is done to significantly reverse and reduce the high levels of nitrate leaching from the farming of the Waimakariri catchment, this loss in drinking water quality will be permanent. The Taonga that is Christchurch's pure groundwater drinking source will be lost to the citizens of Christchurch to the benefit of a few farmers. We will have not protected this resource for future generations. To retain Christchurch's current groundwater quality in the deep aquifers, corresponding to a median nitrate concentration of 0.3 milligrams of nitrate nitrogen per litre, or equivalent to about 23 tonnes of nitrogen per year in the deep aquifers. The nutrient released from current farming needs to be reduced by 94%. I just draw your attention to the plots up here. Uh, you will see that the load from farming under current industry good management practice pops into the catchment about 365 tonnes of nitrogen per year. And you will also see what Plan Change 7 proposes to do to reduce that to about 289 tonnes per year. However, to actually get to a load which will look after Christchurch's groundwater, you have to go to that much lower level indicated on the right, which reflects that concentration of 0.3. This shows how recent Plan Change 7 does not protect Christchurch's groundwater quality and what effect Plan Change 7 has on restoring Christchurch's groundwater quality of what it is. You need a 94% reduction from current practice. You need a 92% reduction from Plan Change 7 to achieve looking after Christchurch's groundwater resource. So much larger nutrient reductions are needed. ECAN's actions to date have ensured the serious degradation of Christchurch's drinking water resource. Now, the situation with this groundwater is a canary in the mine, and it's an example of what is being observed all over Canterbury with the impacts of intensive farming and dairy farming being felt on freshwater environments. Therefore, the long-term plan should address fixing the Canterbury environment. If ECAN really does want to improve the ground and surface water quality in the region, it needs to stop and completely reverse the currently allowed nutrient release to the environment. The nutrient release needs to be brought down to low enough levels that will result in meaningful improvements in all freshwater environments and to levels that result in healthy ecosystems, such as those we had 40 years ago, and not those degraded ecosystems now. Farm environmental plans touted as being a key tool to improving our fresh water environment are largely a waste of time because they do nothing to reduce nutrient release from farms. Nutrient release from farms need to be, needs to be reduced to fix the problem. If nutrient reduction is not done on a large enough scale, the changes you make will still mean that the region's freshwater environment will still be in a severely degraded state. An example of this is what PC7 proposes to do in the Waimakariri zone. The nutrient reductions, unfortunately, are far too small to restore the Waimakariri zone environment to a healthy state and to retain Christchurch's groundwater quality. The LTP needs to recognise these problems and then set out a pathway and framework to fix them. 
if we don't take the total heed of the science, and by that I mean proper interpretation of scientific evidence and not spin and misleading interpretation of science as evidence in recent ECAN reports, you can see my table paper where I refer to some of these, and if we don't head down the right pathway and do the right actions, we will never fix the environmental problems that ECAN has created. Care needs to be taken in vetting proposed science solutions to our environmental problems. For example, I have requested that no more funds be spent on investigating managed aquifer recharge in the LTP. Simple analysis shows that there is no chance. Could I just finish? I've just got a wee paragraph to finish. Would that be right, please? That there is no chance that the technique will provide an answer to the pollution ECAN has allowed. There is not enough low nitrate fresh water available to dilute the pollution to acceptable nitrate concentrations, let alone other issues with this dilution of pollution technique. I have suggested some actions that could be taken to protect Christchurch's groundwater in a paper I have tabled, and they equally apply to the wider Canterbury issues. One key action besides reducing nutrient release is widespread environmental monitoring. This is needed to show where we are currently, even if it's bad, and how we are going with regards to making improvements and whether they are working or not. Without this widespread monitoring, we will never know whether any of the changes we will make will ever be of any value. Thank you, Doug, for your submission. Um, I'm going to say no questions because we have run well over time, but thank you for your full submission. We need to catch up. Thank you. Next, uh, we have a slight change in the order. And we have uh, Ben Williams from Rakaia River Irrigators up next. And then we have one following that. And then we're lunch. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So for those that don't know me, my name is Ben Williams. I'm a partner at Chapman Trip and a resource management specialist. I've been involved in a roundabout way in irrigation and water issues throughout Canterbury for close to 20 years now. It's sort of how I've uh, built my career. Um, today I'm appearing for a Kaya River Irrigators Association. So this is actually the first hearing I ever did was an RRIA hearing. So it's sort of very close to my heart. A little bit old school, but I've got a handout which I'll talk through very quickly. Uh, in the interest, come back to the mic. In the interest of time, I'm going to cut it down to just two points. So I'm happy, obviously, to receive questions at any stage or at the end. So the Rakai River Irrigators Association has actually been around for quite a long time. I actually think it formed informally in the 80s, around the time they were forming the Rakai Water Conservation Order, and then it was formally incorporated in 1996. So who are they? They are the smaller takes, um, which have generally been around since generally the pre-2000, so smaller takes from Rakhaya. They don't include the CPW main take or the Bar Hill Chertsey take on the South Bank. So in recent years, a sort of key role for the RIA has been working with Trust Power on the provision of free stored water. So as a number of you will be aware, Trust Power effectively sells stored water out of Lake Coleridge to Barkle Church, and CPW and potentially others. Um, that has an effect on reliability of existing irrigators. So the RIA has an agreement with Trust Power, which, um, and it's a good relationship with Trust Power, whereby Trust Power provides free stored water to the pre-existing irrigators. Um, through the arrangement. So, and just for completeness, um, the Incorporated Society, as it is at the moment, is likely to become a company very shortly. So, I've given a reasonably comprehensive written submission on the LTP um, and a number of themes quite supportive. So, the two points I wanted to talk through in the interest of time, and is the first one and the third one I've got listed there. So, the First one, which was really the momentum for pulling in the submission, was the RIA 
has been working with Environment Canterbury staff for quite a long time, um, and I want to emphasise the staff have been really good, but a constant theme we've had from those staff around um, flow monitoring and gauging is a under-resourcing. So we've had a couple of instances which I'll explain by the graphs over the page. So the first one happened prior to Christmas where there was a fresh in the river and just to explain flow recording in the Rakaia, it's rather complicated with flows being measured up at the gorge and then effectively irrigation takes back calculated from that. Now that's very dependent upon understanding exactly what the gauging is and what the riverbed looks like at the gorge and of course with a large river you have a fresh come through and it changes the bed profile so the gauging can very quickly or need to be recalibrated and or give a false reading. So what happened in that first graph there was there was a fresh back in mid-December or to the left of the graph there and then the river dropped effectively with a recorder read a lot lower than what the river was actually flowing. So that meant irrigation went on restriction for a considerable period of time through the Christmas break as it turned out and irrigators were on full restriction despite there being lots of water in the river. Um, we worked with Environment Canterbury staff at the time and sort of acknowledged that this was far from ideal. I think Environment Canterbury subcontracts to NIWA, um, but the general sentiment we got was that um, there is a considerable under-resource in terms of actually managing flows, engaging sites, and we've tried to do our best, but um, we're really going to need more money to get out more often to do more gaugings. And just over the page um, is the reverse situation where irrigators effectively, and this is a smaller time sequence, um, irrigators were able to take water for a lot longer and the environmental flows in the river, if you like, were a lot lower than they should have been. So it is an unders and over scenario. The downside from the RIA perspective is when that turned off when they shouldn't be, they potentially need to look to trust power to purchase water, so it has a financial implication for them. So the RIA is certainly supportive of the efforts of ECAN staff to date, but would like to see more resourcing put into general flow monitoring and compliance. Um, the second point, which I'll cover off just again, I'm not going to cover every point in the interest of timing, was just around the essential freshwater program. So the majority of RRIA takes are on the north bank of the river, who and they've already already been through the Sound Waihora process. The take of water itself from the Rakaia is managed through the water conservation order, and certainly I'd be very keen to, you know, there's a complete acceptance that ECAN's got a lot of work ahead of it in terms of implementing the NPS and the essential freshwater program. But equally, we want to see areas that a lot of work has been done already, such as what Sal and Waihora um, are not forgotten about in terms of actually recognising that, you know, there's a really great platform to work from. And in many instances, it may well be that efforts are better focused elsewhere. So that's all I'm proposing to say in the interest of time, unless you want me to expand any other points. So. Thank you for that. We can take two or three questions and have Nicole Marshall. Did you? Yeah. You didn't? Oh, you must have been waving at Sunia. Lan. Thanks for your submission, Ben. Um, I want to ask about the actual level of monitoring that you're, you know, which would be ideal from your perspective. So do you have a broad idea of what level of expenditure an, a, an appropriate monitoring system would be? So I think Sorry, I, in your button. Sorry, yeah. I think the status quo position is, and it's not an exact number each year, but ECAN generally budgets on 12 recalibrations for gauging, which at the time, and this discussion is about a year old now, cost about $2,500 for ECAN to subcontract out NEWA. The discussion we had at that time was perhaps only two or three extra gaugings, particularly over that Christmas break when everyone's hard to get hold of um could make quite a material difference so that probably is a reasonably firm indication of the sort of numbers we're talking about any further questions grant just just for clarification really on page 
you're saying it's not currently possible to measure the actual flow in the Rakaia River. A current consents based on terms of achieving the river flow, um, are, they, are they operating basically on the basis of little or no information? Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of information there, and I sort of, again, in the interest of time, I'm going to pass over this very quickly. So effectively, because we're dealing with a braided river, you can't actually measure flow in the lower catchment where a lot of these takes are. So effectively, you have to do a back calculation exercise where you measure flows at the gorge and then that informs, so consents in reference to the gorge flow, which is well above them rather than at their point of take. Um, so there's enough information there subject to it being appropriately calibrated and engaged, which is really important. So it's not like other rivers where there's a fixed flow reporter site downstream where it's reasonably easy to understand what's going on. So there is quite a bit of maths behind the scene. Thank you for that. Any further questions? If not, um, thank you for uh, the time consideration and thank you for coming in and presenting. I know that the folk in that space do, do face some challenges, so thank you for your submission today. Thank you. Our final submission today is uh, Shana Fitzjohn. Um, we mix up in times, but welcome in and we get through this one. We will be good and almost on track. Thank you. Uh, submission 1007. 1007? No, it's it is tomorrow. Yeah. It's today. It's today. So it's, yeah, shut up. Press the button on one. That... There we go. Excellent. Um, kia ora, everybody, and um, apologies for turning up a day early, but, um, oops, oh well. Call Siana Fitz, John Aho, and thank you for the opportunity to submit on your long term plan. Um, my background is in a bat is a, in a Bachelor of Science majoring in Geography and a Master's in Science Communication. And in my paid work, I coordinate the Responsible Business Network for Lincoln and Biotown and so on. So I've lived close to Darfield next to the Greendale Fault Line for 20 years, which is most of my life. And I'd like to start by acknowledging Ngāi and the Indigenous peoples of this land and the violent colonialisation of Aotearoa past and present, which has led us to the environmental situation that we face today. So out of the two options proposed in the long term plan, if I was to choose one, I'd support option one. And as a permanent resident of Selwyn, I support the rates rise that option one will require. However, I can't believe I'm agreeing with Federated Farmers when I say that I don't necessarily believe that the rate increases will lead to a healthier environment. Because unless we make more fundamental changes to the culture of ECAN and in the wider community, we're going to continue to plunge into ecological collapse. So because ecological and climate collapses are systemic, we need more systemic solutions. Expensive environmental engineering projects um, aren't going to solve this crisis. We need broader and more basic solutions. So I've lived near Charing Cross for 20 years, and in that 20 years, I've watched a huge number of mature trees getting cut down in the area, even as the heat waves become more frequent. I've watched the boom of the dairy industry and its rapid and industrial intensification, watched the giant factory being built in Darfield, and watch more and more trees and shelter belts be cut down to make way for giant irrigators. And unfortunately, suddenly it didn't seem to matter that animals could no longer shelter from the wind, the sun or the rain. It didn't matter that they end up standing in mud and river, riverbed rocks in the middle of winter. And it became common practice for calves to be shot a few days old to make way for the industrial milking machine. This happens on farms near me. I've talked to the workers there and the stories are horrific. Irrigation companies are taking tonnes of water from the rivers. It's getting pumped onto dry pastures to allow cows to produce tonnes of milk. Then Fonterra is burning tonnes of coal to burn the water back out of that milk. And at the end of that whole shit show, we get milk powder. And it's not actually helping anybody. So ECAN deals with the water consents and you have allowed this to happen. So you talk about, in your consultation document, you talk about balancing ecology and economy. And that's the point I'll come back to. But when I look at the land around our home, I don't see a balance. There's industrial agriculture, there's grass for kilometres. We've pushed out all other forms of life. Now, please don't take this as a blanket condemnation of farming or of farmers, because I actually empathise with many of the concerns that farmers have raised today. But please don't forget that many of them own vast areas of land. 
they are privileged in a way that most of my generation will never ever get to be privileged. And with that privilege comes an immense moral responsibility. And I think it's time we started holding each other more morally responsible. There's a passage of the summary document in the long-term plan and it says, environment can be works with Naitahu, Papatupu, Runanga, and other councils, regions, stakeholders, central government, and the wider community to ma manage the use and quality of our natural resources, including fresh water, coastal waters, air, and biodiversity. So you meant, we also mentioned we're entering a new era, era of collaboration between organizations and a new approach for the management of natural resources in the region. So I want to make a point that if we continue to regard fresh water, coastal waters, air and biodiversity as natural resources, we're going to continue to make the same mistakes. Language is a really powerful thing, and the term resource implies resource use, and we often refer to that in consent processes and district plans. So if we were to refer to one another like that, if we, if we talked about using people and using one another, it would sit quite uncomfortably. And the idea of using resources that are actually living beings that should sit just as uncomfortably. Yet, unfortunately, that's the way we've learned to be in our in relationship with the ecosystem that's our home. So the document refers to Te Mana o Te Wai, and that sounds like a really excellent start. Um, and like I, I'm, yeah, I'd like to voice my support for that. Um, yet simultaneously, it refers to the management of water. So I'd like to, you to acknowledge that these two ways of referring to water are in conflict with one another because one of them acknowledges the mana, the life force, and the dignity of water itself, yet the other suggests that there, that water is something we're entitled to control. So until we recognize that there's a fundamental difference in this worldview and make deeper changes to the nature of this organization, you won't be able to live up to your responsibilities and protect the ecosystems of Canterbury. In the planning document, you also refer to balancing cultural, social, and economic and environmental well-beings as if those can be separated from one another. Um, if, you can, if you continue to use this framework, you're not going to be able to make better decisions because everything that we value, all the lives that we lead are within the environment. It can't be balanced or traded against anything. We're not separate from it and every time it takes a hit, our entire community suffers. A couple of weeks ago, we held a public meeting on the Mayfield Hines Valletta irrigation consent, but we held that meeting. ECAN didn't hold that meeting. We heard the community concerns. We discussed all of the issues that arose from that consent application. And ECAN missed out in hearing those views and hearing that expertise. So there are laws that allowed that 10 year consent to be regranted and passed through the organization without any public notification. And those laws need to change if you guys even have a hope of improving the environmental situation in Canterbury. So I think the fact that this consent was granted is a perfect example of the problem, problems within the culture of ECAN. And a commissioner that can read the RMA in such a way that it could let intensive agriculture continue like this. It just shows that deeper changes are needed than you've outlined in your consultation document. In your transformational opportunity section, you refer to facilitating the diversification of land, of land use. So you need to step up and start saying no to the consents that facilitate monocultures and intensive agriculture, because you can't say yes to something without saying no to something else. And making these decisions are actually a lot more simple than you're making them. As far as the cultural change within ECAN, um, a, lot of responsible, a lot of responsibility lies with the chief executive. So please, ensure that ECAN lives up to its own principles because at the moment it's fallen well short of them. Jenny Huey made a statement at the beginning of the consultation document and said environment Canterbury is required by our community and by central government to not just stop any decline in our environment but to actively improve it for future generations. Now if that's what is required of you by our community and by central government you have a mandate to make the decisions necessary to protect our environment. You have that mandate. You don't need to cave to people in the community that are angry with the decisions you might make to protect that environment because people are always going to be angry. But are they going to be angry now about the decisions you make? Or are they going to be angry when we can't farm anymore, when we can't grow food and when we have to move from this place because it is so desertified? 
So please take that mandate and use it to make the right decisions now, as opposed to continuing down this path. We all have a choice. We can read and obey the laws with a very narrow, narrow and shallow conception of what it means to allow trade-offs for the health of an ecosystem. Or we have the opportunity to change, to take lessons from Te Ao Māori and recognise the whenua, the water and the web of lives and forces that make up an ecosystem as something that's alive, conscious, it's our home, and it is deserving of far greater care and respect than we have given it since we, and I'm referring to Pākehā colonisers here, pushed our way onto this land. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for that. Two questions. We have two minutes. Lan. Kia ora, Siana. Thanks for that. Um, I wanted to touch in on specifically, like noting your comments around um, consenting and how just all that. Um, but my comment, uh, my question is about um, you talked about leadership in this space in terms of facilitating diversification of land use and that is in our strategic direction and something we want to do more of um but the level of which we've got in this ltp is just i guess a starting point of that do you think we should be taking a more urgent more well-resourced role in this space can i interpret what you're saying is that or or is it you you would prefer that it's more in that stopping pollution or stopping the activities? I think the two can go hand in hand. So I think you could provide far more support for farmers who are trying to embrace more regenerative practices. Um, so it's not all about saying no and refusing consents, but I think you also do need to refuse some big consents in order to make the space for those, um, for those innovations to take place. Um, so providing more support and incentives for farmers and also using your voice to lobby central government for more support um, for farmers to, for, to transfer to regenerative land use um, because, you know, they do need, they do need that support. Um, but that won't happen if the consents keep getting granted for intensive land use. Thank you, Shana, for your passionate and intense submission. We now break for lunch and we start again at one o'clock. <laughs>